Good evening, everyone. Uh, from what I can see, we're still waiting on one trustee, so we'll give a couple more minutes here for people to file into the virtual room and then we can start our meeting. Well, it is 7.03 p.m. I know we are waiting on uh, trustee Coombs Ismail to join us. He's let us know he's running a few minutes late, but will be joining us. Um, but given that we have a rather packed agenda tonight, I propose we, we get this meeting started. He will hopefully join us very soon and uh, weigh in. So I would like to now at 7.03 p.m. on April 6, 2021, Called meeting call to order the meeting of the town of Netherland Board of Trustees. Miranda, would you please call the roll? Mayor Larson. Here. Trustee Taylor. Here. Trustee Apt. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Baumhover. Here. Trustee Danforth. Here. Trustee Corvalin. Here. And I will make note in the records of when Trustee Coombs is mile arrives. Thank you, Miranda. Moving forward, we have our consent agenda for the evening, which has uh, six items on it. Does anyone from the Board of Trustees have any questions or comments or a motion regarding the consent agenda? This is Trustee Taylor. Uh, I, I noticed that the changes to the ordinance number 645 were larger than I thought they were going to be, but I did double check them against the online record and the, uh, the, uh, no, the What's the word the meeting minutes and uh, felt pretty comfortable that those were all the correct changes. So I will move to approve the consent agenda. Um, we have this, a motion uh, on the table. Uh, uh, this, okay, we have a motion and a second and I hear Tanya you want to I think that was Tanya well, wasn't I it? Was, yeah, okay. I was interesting that this is Tanya that because I felt the same way as Jillian there was more more to it. I always wanted more discussion about it. Uh, because what are the different, what are the differences in the amended version and the current paper version besides what we agreed on? And I went over the minutes and I actually didn't, 
feel that it was the same as the online version. So it's interesting. We're coming from two different places on this. Do you want um, the town attorney Jennifer Madsen to highlight the the changes? You want to have a quick discussion on that? Yeah, because uh, there seems we're, to be. We're, we're just in the middle of the. We, we have a motion on the table, so we would have to, you know, just. So, uh, do you what do you have what questions you have for uh, Attorney Madsen? Well, my question is, it's, it was never actually clear that the uh, central business district became exempted or was stopped being exempted from the parking restrictions. It, it, it actually didn't seem to occur. I saw that there was something about the paying into the parking fund, but there was instructions about what to do to change it. And they were supposed to strike a couple lines in the amendment. Um, and off the top of my head, I think it was line three or four. Uh, let's see, eliminate to eliminate the requirement, no amendment is necessary to have the parking requirement apply in the CBD, move to strike the third and fourth sentences. And I don't see that they ever did that uh, in, in this. And then as far as the differences between the two, because this one's got a lot more to it. Yeah, I would like to know what's being added that wasn't in the minutes. So those are my two concerns just off the top of my head. Okay, and before we have um, the town attorney answer that, I just want to note for the record that Trustee Coombs Ismail has joined us this evening. Jennifer? Uh, yes, I can respond. Let me respond to the question about related to section 16202 and the parking standards designated for each use. So if you go to page, let me see here. I'm on page 14 of the minutes. The minutes are, um, you know, this whole, well, give me a, whole issue. Issue. Get me that to get sure. there. Cause sure. And let me just say that this whole issue is, is a little bit, I mean, more than a little bit, but it's a mess. I'm not confident on this. I'm just gonna say, I, I'm more well, confused let her than ever. Let her, let her answer your question, Tanya. Okay. I so, am trying to get to minutes here. Okay, page, well, I'm not actually, I'm looking at the, what page is it on the uh, packet agenda? Oh, I, I don't have that in front of me. Miranda, could you get there? I don't know if you can. I, I just don't, the, yeah, these don't have. I, so there you go. Wait, let me see. No, you're not there. Um, Is it oh, wait, go back up, go back up. It's the fourth amendment. Oh, yes, it's the there. fourth I'm amendment. Thinking. So it's the fourth amendment um, and it's at the bottom of that page right there, um, which I'm looking at as the 14th page. So it starts there and um, it says that this amendment concerns section 28 amending section 16-202 of the parking standards designated for each use. The issue here is whether or not to require applicants to supply parking in the CBD. This ordinance, as it currently reads, would eliminate off-street parking requirements in the CD, CBD. And so then there's a staff recommendation as to um, require applicants to, the parking applies in the CBD and the applicants could be required to pay into the commercial parking fund. Then you have to scroll down in the minutes and um, okay, so it's then actually the next page after the discussion of the fifth amendment where Mayor Pro Tem Cornell, and this is probably two thirds <laughs> the way down in the minutes Mayor Pro Tem Cornell made a motion and Trustee Allen seconded it to approve Amendment 4, changing Section 28 of the ordinance to adding the language allowing payment to the, into the fund or providing parking behind or under the building in the CBD. A roll call vote of the BOT resulted in the motion passing unanimously. Okay. So it didn't, it didn't have to do with the striking of those 
uh, sentences and four or whatever it was. Correct. Correct. Yeah, it's a amendment four relates to section 16202, which is what we I had looked at um, a couple of weeks ago related to the required off street parking. Okay, and why is this uh, um, ordinance so much bigger than the paper version? There's like four or five more things added. What is added on? Well, so the ordinance is, is larger in terms of length because the, the ordinance is um, what you would call a, essentially a legislative version which shows all of the changes to the code language. Um, anything that is um, added is gonna be underlined and anything that is removed is stricken, has that um, text, the strikeout text. So because it includes the strikeout text, it is going to be longer um, in but the form. But there's more sections. 31 sections in in the first one, and there's 36 in this one. So wh what are the extra five sections? Well, like on the, I mean, that that's what, that's what's weird to me. Mm -hmm. Right, because I was looking at the one you mailed me a long time ago of the one, the paper version, and it stops at section 31, and this goes on to section 36, and I'm just, Curious, you know, since what what are the five more sections? That seems like a bigger deal. I understand the strikeout and all that. That that makes it longer, but I mean literally more sections. Mm -hmm. So this the 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 ordinance that you have in the packet, the corrected ordinance number six forty five. Yeah, has this, thirty six let, sections. Okay, so let me tell you where this was found. This was found in the email records of um, the town administrator, and this is, is what was forwarded on um, to other people as far as what had been adopted. I haven't actually looked at um, so this the wasn't additional this sections. So this Tanya. is just email? Tanya, the, yeah. the, 30, the I'm just trying to clarify here the, the difference in section numbers. You're saying yeah. when you say the paper yes. version, do you mean the version that was published within the Mountaineer? No, I mean the the one that the incorrect one. The incorrect in the, one. Well, right, I'm, the one that the the one the original one. Let's use that, not okay. the, paper the paper version. Yeah. Right, because the the one that was published within the Mountaineer has 36 sections. Yeah, but where did the Mountaineer get all that information? Okay, the, I just wanted this. to just find that's, which is which. That's, it, the Mountaineer got it, it from this. Saying, they got it from, from, from the corrected ordinance. What was sent to the Mountaineer is, I don't, I don't have what the Mountaineer had, but gotcha. from what I can tell as closely as possible, this corrected ordinance um, number 645 that you have in your packet, that is what was sent to the Mountaineer. So that's what matches up with the publication. Yeah, I get it that they got the information. That's, I'm not seeing that. And I was just curious what the big differences would be um, in from the original one to this new one that we're gonna be approving. That's just what are the five different there? Um, is it just or is just after thirty one? They're just new ones there, and those weren't in the original. So to be honest, I've gone through and I've checked the meeting minutes to this to make sure that the meeting minutes were included in this. I also reviewed it with the publication. Um, clearly, in my opinion, the ordinance six forty five that we have in our books is wrong. So I didn't compare it to that 645 that's in our books. Okay, just whatever the Mountaineer has is correct. Well, it's correct um, to the extent- Where did they get information? That it's not somebody, the town clerk would have sent them the 
the the ordinance that you have in your packet. Yeah. Okay. So what? So there's I mean, some emails and whatnot that were pieced together. And yes. Mountaineer had those, and then they put that together. Yes. And what likely happened is that we had a draft ordinance that was prepared in advance of that January 2008 meet, um, meeting. The meeting occurred, there were amendments at the meeting and the draft ordinance that was prepared and presented to the Board of Trustees is likely what was signed. Um, and no changes were made to that draft ordinance that would reflect the amendments made at the meeting. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I guess I'm still trying to understand all the differences. Um, it's so a lot to go over. Largely what it seems like here is you had a clerical issue happen with this draft ordinance, which is what they actually signed and put in record, but Roger's motion at that time, instead of motioning to strike the actual language, he motioned after the discussion for the staff to fix the ordinance to make it reflect what the discussion was, which leaves us with a really, really bad picture of the past because there were specific instructions of what needed to be struck. And instead, after the discussion down on that other page, you see a motion uh seconded by what of that trustee allen at that time to approve amendment four changing section 28 in the ordinance to add the language allowing payments so long as that included the providing the parking behind and under the cbd which came about because the attorney suggested that they could maybe amend this clause so what we have is a really really poor record and then a clerical error that signed a false amendment be well it was a false ordinance because they had amended that ordinance five times in the meeting and yet what was signed was the original draft ordinance that didn't include any of those amendments is that correct yes as best as i can tell that's correct okay so this is trustee taylor i just thought i'd mention that I think an equally interesting question here is how did the incorrect ordinance end up in our published paper document? What we have here is a problem of custody. The, the custodial responsibility was not properly fulfilled during that time. I have placed a motion on the table to approve this, not because I believe this ordinance is absolutely correct, but because I believe that before we can amend this law, before we can correct this law, we need to have an agreement between all of the copies of this law. So, uh, Tanya, I am not arguing that this is an exemplary ordinance. I am arguing that before we can start making changes, which will not happen during this meeting, uh, but during future meetings, perhaps, before we can amend this and fix it, we need to have full agreement between the online and paper copies. That's what's driving my issue here. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask just a quick question? Go for it, Eric. The the part of it that uh, conf that confuses me a bit is is this uh, notion that there were the third and fourth sentences. Uh, that once seemed to have existed uh, as uh, indicated in the minutes uh, for the fourth amendment, uh, that those third and fourth sentences would have to be stricken in order to then add this these new sentences that uh, indicate that the CBD uh, will be required to have these off street parking requirements. And I wonder why the resolution that we have in the amended ordinance does not include those sentences with a strike through on them. And I know that this is like really nitpicky, but it feels like they should be there. Let me look, I need to pull up. So um, I need to pull up the ordinance 645 that's in the, that's in our books. 
Um, so I need to get that from my emails. Okay, because I have been unable to find those third and fourth sentences that are that are referenced in the minutes in any of the materials in the packet, uh, whether it's in the Mountaineer or otherwise. I mean, the Mountaineer article is very difficult to read because it includes all the language that would have had strike throughs in it, and there are no strike throughs, and so it becomes very challenging to read. Other questions, comments, thoughts? I just remind everyone we actually have an active motion on the table, which we we're discussing. Not okay. hearing. Actually, I just wanted to make a comment on the solarized uh, part of the motion and simply state that uh, solarized Netherlands will make available discounted solar panels to people in Netherland. We're hoping to get 20 people to sign up, at which point we'll get uh, we'll get a discount. Uh, and the cost of solar panels has come down from $26,000 for the average house system 10 years ago to 13,000 now. So, you know, a huge drop and a third of that becomes a uh, solar tax credit. So uh, just encouraging people to keep an eye on this. And if you're interested in getting solar panels, this is a great opportunity. We're going to keep looking for solar garden opportunities, but if you're looking to put some on your own house, this is a great opportunity. Um, Absolutely. Why are we voting for everything at once? Is, I mean. So but right now we have a motion on the consent. table to approve. Hold up to approve the consent agenda. We are open at this time. If you would like to. You would have to make a you would have to get the motion makers approval Julian's to allow a friendly amendment to the motion. Should you wish to pull any particular item? Yeah, I am open to that amendment. So, well, Tanya, just, do you I personally am all for solar, but I'm not sure I'm ready to per personally vote for their ordinance 625 right now 645. <laughs> Hey, Julian. Oh, I, I mean, so it's a little confusing to me why we have to say yes to everything. I guess that's how you guys, I, I'm new. That, that was the motion on the table. Gotcha. That's, and so if you want, you can make a, a friendly amendment, make a motion, a friendly amendment to remove ordinance 645 or whatever that is consent agenda 3 item 3.4 from the consent agenda. I would like to make a friendly amendment to remove 3.4 from the consent agenda and add it to the action item to give Jennifer some time to respond to the question that Trustee Coombs Ismail has asked and allow us to move on with the meeting in the meantime. I second Trustee that. Taylor? Trustee Taylor. Uh, yes, I, I am uh, perfectly happy with that amendment. Okay, so we have a motion and a second on the table to approve the consent agenda items one, two, three, five, and six Correct. and move. Number four to an action item, which I would propose we put after our discussion items to give that time for trustee for our town attorney to do the research. Fully in agreement. Miranda, would you please call the vote? Mayor Pro Tem Baumhover? Yes. Trustee Kim Zismile? Yes. Trustee Apt? Yes. Mayor Larson? Yes. Trustee Danforth? Yes. Trustee Corbelin? Yes. Trustee Taylor? Yes. And I'm, thank you, I'm muted. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> we'll return to that uh, consent agenda item resolution 2021-6 regarding ordinance 645 later in this meeting. Right now, however, we will move forward into our agenda beginning with public comment on non-agenda items. Um, if anyone from the public would like to speak on something that is not on tonight's agenda, now would be your opportunity. Um, raise your hand, jump on video and start dancing, speak up or somehow catch our attention, you can have three minutes of time.
scrolling the participants list, looking for hands. All the videos. Not seeing or hearing any. We will move forward into our informational item for this evening, which is a presentation from the Communities That Care Coalition regarding a Youth Opportunity Advisory Board. board. And I believe we have Ben Coldsmith with us, as well as some members of the youth community to present this. Ben, welcome back. Hi there, good to see everyone again. Uh, yeah, um, so uh, you've heard from Communities That Care before, but really briefly, coalition of youth educators, uh, service providers locally here in the community. Um, and really happy to be back to speak to you with you all again. Uh, the two coalition members, youth coalition members that are joining me, uh, I'm gonna start out just briefly relating some of their experiences around youth opportunity here will sort of set the stage for um, the idea that I'm gonna talk I'm going to talk to you about today. So we'll start with Alicia, if you can unmute and share some thoughts. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, my name is Alicia Nitsch and I'm a senior at Netherland Middle Senior High School this year. And I'm a member of the Communities That Cares Coalition's YLA work group. So Youth Leadership Academy. And I joined the YLA four years ago because there aren't there weren't many like community service options that I could participate in the within in the community. There wasn't much I could do that was a job or a volunteer opportunity while remaining in the community, except for the YLA. But the YLA is a paid job. It's not a volunteer opportunity. And many high schoolers need volunteer opportunities in today's competitive climate for resumes and colleges. And if there are volunteer opportunities in the community, they're not advertised well or recognized by high schoolers very much because no one really knows about them, which causes a lot of people to leave the community for these opportunities, which I think just creates a general detachment between youth and the community of Netherlands. And Megan's going to talk to you a bit more about that. Yes, so building off of what Eli said, it is true that oftentimes when we go looking for opportunities to build our resume and make connections, we can't really find them locally and networking is a really important time when you're trying to build your resume for college applications or anything else after high school. Um, my experience with this specifically was um, a couple years ago when I was looking for a volunteer position and I'm sure there was something locally, but I really couldn't find anything that worked for me or anything in general. So I ended up doing some volunteering in Boulder but I know for a lot of kids that wouldn't be possible or it's just not convenient in general. So I do think that there needs to be more opportunities for people to have more civic engagement. Um, and I did join the YLA to have this kind of experience, but the YLA cannot um, have the amount of people that are potentially interested because it is a paid position and it is just a one group. So I think having another group that's more focused on volunteering and civic engagement would be really helpful. And I think Ben can provide more details. Yeah, sorry, Ben, gonna cut in again. Um, oh, another sure. example of this that um, both Megan and I are part of the National Honor Society in Netherlands, and that needs roughly 20 hours of volunteering every year to just remain a member, which technically isn't very many hours, but is when you add it on top of schoolwork and other extracurriculars. But the hardest part wasn't the actual volunteering, but finding the volunteer opportunities because there just weren't any that were available in the community. So it got to the point where we were like having to go out of our way to create opportunities for ourselves by asking to tutor classes in the school or in the elementary school, or even like creating events that we could then volunteer at which was kind of a little bit of a stressful experience. So Ben, take it away. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, that was the first time I heard of the creating events that you could then volunteer at. Um, certainly, yeah. So these are the kinds of experiences and, 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 and also I've heard a lot about um, kind of the morale uh, young people are feeling when a lot of 
like half their class will leave between elementary school and high school. Um, this kinds of experiences led our coalition to consider uh, a youth advisory board that would help open up additional opportunities for youth. Um, so I'm just going to go over that and try to not take too much of your time with it. Uh, if we can begin the uh, slides, Miranda. Thank you. Um, so as alluded to, the, the, the reasons uh, for creating this relate to youth uh, wellness and opportunity. Um, research shows that what we call opportunities for pro-social engagement protect youth from uh, the effects of risk factors that are in their environments. We're talking about not just you know how well they do in getting into college and getting jobs later, which is really important, but it also impacts substance uh, misuse and men mental health. Um, and you heard this already from from the young folks, and you know no parent in Netherlands needs a uh, set of data to tell you that um, this is a protective factor where there's a lot of opportunity for us to. Uh, improve on, but we do have data that bore that out. Um, and so without reviewing what the young folks already uh, tell, told you, um, I'll just, I'll mention about this, what's on this slide is that the high school happens to be implementing a career focus, like career focused edu education tracks. Um, in my conversations with them, they're also concerned about the availability of real world experience outside of school hours um, that young people can build related to the education they're receiving. Um, and I want to mention, um, also as alluded to, that this is an equity issue. So, um, I mean, it's sad when anyone has to leave the community to uh, get those opportunities, whether it's an inter internship or after school or summer employment. But for families with lower resources, uh, they may not be able to access these at all. Um, Miranda, next slide, please. Thank you. So the purpose of this Youth Opportunity Advisory Board, YOAB, maybe we'll work on the name. Um, it's really modeled off of uh, something that's going on in Boulder and it's called the YOAB. Uh, the purpose is to partner with the community and high schools to provide these opportunities for civic engagement. Um, it's to engage that youth board in local decision-making processes. Um, especially where in matters that impact them um, or where there may be opportunities that can be opened up for youth involvement, uh, employment, um, volunteering. Um, skills development, of course, not just in the opportunities they open up, but for those youth who are in the board to learn problem solving, information gathering, conflict resolution, organizational function, this will really be um, Obviously, a great civics lesson as well. Um, but yeah, the, the main purpose is to identif identify and advocate for the creation of youth educational employment and recreational opportunities in our community. And uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, how is this? How would this board look? It would consist of eight members. Um, eligible youth, uh, the way we're looking at it currently, would be uh, eligible to attend either Netherland High School, Gilpin, or Chinook West. So students who might not be in those schools and may have another situation like homeschooling, but who are eligible would still be included. Um, we would roll out an application process. Youth would then be interviewed by a board that would consist of the sitting YOAB. Uh, the initial group, since there's no sitting YOAB, would be uh, interviewed by the Youth Leadership Academy, one town representative, and one adult member of communities that care. Um, and the idea we have is that those recommended members would then be appointed by the town. Um, it may not be possible to do that really in an official sense, but at least some sort of um, ceremonial way, some recognition um, for those appointments. Um, and again, with the population reach and equity, uh, we'd be working with the schools really closely and other members of the community to reach students who might not see this opportunity or might see it and say, well, I'm going to have transportation issues. I've got this or that obstacle. It's not really meant for me, but these are, but, but our talented kids and we would, we would proactively seek those folks out, those young people out to include them um, in this. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so what would they be doing on a regular basis? They would meet, the group would meet 
you're in school hours for five to six hours per month during the school year, only minutes would be posted online. Um, there's discussion with the high school about uh, the, the members being excused for class and even possibly receiving credit for this work. Um, and obviously to participate in other other meetings re related to our town and community, um, probably expected to spend two to three hours a month outside of uh, school time. Um, and as far as those activities go and what young people would be considered considering in this first round, especially, but probably as any group comes on board, uh, it would be really helpful to have a list of suggested from town staff or the BOT of upcoming projects and challenges that youth voice would be uh, welcomed on, um, that youth may wanna learn more about, uh, that maybe holds some potential for opening up opportunities for youth beyond the eight on that board, which is really the point here. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so yeah, to, to that point, uh, the YOAB would be, is not just an extracurricular for eight students. The point is to represent and be accountable to stakeholders. Primarily, that's the peers of that, of those eight people. But that will also include staff and administration at the high schools, uh, student government, youth leadership, academy members. And also there's this exciting uh, thing we're doing with the uh, the library we're uh, rolling out around the same time as this initiative, we're planning to roll out sort of a peak to peak media project where young people will be doing um, podcasting out in the field reporting um, and eventually even some video. Um, and that application of youth voice will also serve as like a, as an accountability mechanism. Uh, next slide, slide please. Um, I know this sounds like a lot, uh, so I want to assure this all volunteer board and very, very busy town staff that none of this will require town resources or staffing. Uh, communities that care recently received a grant that has really increased our capacity. Uh, we'll be able to fully staff uh, and resource all uh, this group and all of its processes um, and are not asking for resources or staffing. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, little graphic. Um, so what those youth will receive, they'll receive training on rele relevant topics like public speaking, on government structure, meeting facilitation, uh, equity. Uh, we'll recruit regional and local professionals to help out with that uh, through our networks and uh, meeting space supplies will all be provided be uh, by either Teen Zinc, the library, the high school. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, so I what would be helpful, there are seven things that would be really helpful and we could use the town and board of trustees support on to finish up. Uh, one of those I alluded to earlier, which is list of upcoming projects and conversations that would be relevant to uh, the development of the skills of the eight youth in the uh, YOAB, but also it, where they may find opportunities to uh, open up the peers. Um, and build and select areas to focus on to begin with. Um, next then to engage the youth on those selected areas of focus by creating spaces in decision-making bodies uh, relevant to those focus areas. Again, um, going to see over here uh, within, you know, ways that it can be done following the law and procedure. Um, it may not be able to be, um, they may not be able to be called in role or something but um, they can be highlighted even if it's in um, public comment sections, right? Um, however it works. Um, next slide, please. Um, so other than that, a primary point of contact would be helpful if this gets off the ground uh, this coming school year. Again, we have our own staffing, the youth would run their own processes, just a liaison um, as a point of contact. Um, we'd love some feedback at some point. Uh, um, in the coming weeks um, and recommendations on how this program could work and what we can do to make it more most effective. Um, it would be also ideal if at the end of each term, which means at the end of each school year, uh, if there was some way to recognize publicly the contributions this board makes 
Um, and finally, um, just in general for our town to take pride then in being a leader and innovator in youth engagement and youth opportunity, really undermine those narratives that were discussed of, you know, where, where people feel like you is the place you have to leave at a certain age in order to access these things. Um, so I'm happy to take questions if there are any, but also obviously suggestions um, further down the line or written suggestions um, would be welcome in further conversations. Uh, really appreciate all your time with, uh, on this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Ben, and thank you also to Alicia and Megan. That's a great presentation and an awesome idea. I think this is a great plan and really well, great timing too for it. I know that um, the next agenda item we have tonight is about Envision 2030, and one of the topics that keeps coming up during the Envision 2030 meetings is how we can build better communications and better relationships between the town of Nederland and the school district, and you know work together with the schools and particularly with the students to build that relationship and to become more of a community that way. And I think this is an incredible step in that direction. Uh, I can't wait to see it get started and uh, support it in any way we can come August. And uh, I, like, I love the idea of holding a swearing in ceremony just as we do for, for our town marshal. We're gonna swear in the, the YOAB board as well. I love it. Um, uh, other board members have questions? Uh, start, I'll just go down the, Alphabetical, starting with Alan, since I saw some videos pop on. Yeah, I think I think it's a great idea, and uh, I can see how it could really dovetail with things that other various boards and commissions are doing based on students' interests. You know, the uh, Sustainability Advisory Board, the Parks and Rec Board. You know, so I see a lot of opportunities where we'd love to have input from youth. So, uh, looks exciting. Thank you. Eric? Yeah, I'll second that. I think this is a really great idea. Thank you, Megan and Alicia and Ben. Uh, really, really awesome. I uh, can't wait for it to get started up. And I think there are some great opportunities for YOAB to have liaisons to town advisory boards and hopefully make that kind of a maybe a permanent function of the YOAB to have those liaisons so that we can uh, make sure that y'all are involved kind of at every stage of the decision making process and you see how it all operates, but also so we can get some very valuable input, I think, from up and coming members of our community. I think this is really awesome. Thank you guys. Jonathan. No, I can't add much more than everybody else has already said. We have long kind of looked for ways to connect the youth in town with town staff and government the advisory boards uh, and opportunities. And to hear that there's a hard time finding volunteer opportunities, definitely I think we need to find better ways to network between the town and the schools and the various nonprofits, the ice rink, Ned's Gate, various things like that. So I'm glad to hear that we're gonna be doing this and uh, thanks for all your hard work. Julian. Uh, yeah, I think it's a fantastic idea and I'm I'm not sure if it would be would it be inappropriate for me to uh, volunteer to be the uh, liaison with the YOAB? Because I, I would be happy to do that if uh, no I, one I, else wants it more. I think it just jumped to the top of the list. I was going to make a comment at the end. I think they're going to have trouble narrowing down who wants to be the, the yeah, liaison. I, say, so. I will fight you for that, Julian. <laughs> I'm, I am. I am uh, okay, well, okay, so we'll have a good fight about this and then uh, the winner, <laughs> winner takes YOAB. Okay. But uh, yes, I'm I'm actually inspired to help on this. So, um, very good stuff. Thank you very much, Lindsay. That's hard to add any more to this. Um, but I I'm very excited to have the participation, and I'm in full support of all of this. And uh, yeah, glad to see glad to see getting the youth involved with the town. Yeah, Tanya. Hi, well, I just want to say um, this is a great presentation for and you guys did a really good job. Um, all the speakers, so thank you guys. Um, and I've been off and on talking to all these people. For the past 6 months or so, as this idea has been developing, and so it's really nice to see it. On paper in this um, presentation that you've created, um, and I've been hate to tell you. Uh, probably the liaison since I've been on the board already, but if somebody else really, really wants to do it, 
I mean, or maybe we could all do it together. I don't think there's any reason we need to just have one because everyone here has different strengths. So, you know, for instance, if Eric has so much with uh, human resources and in, in that sort of department where if somebody, I mean, I think the idea is eventually that for them to break into smaller groups of their own interests, but I might be wrong. And so in that case, different board members might be better mentors than others. I defer to the already extant uh, uh, liaison. Thank you, Tanya, and thank you, Tanya, to for having worked with them the last six months. That's awesome. I, I really do think this is an incredible opportunity for the town, for the schools, for you guys. Um, and yeah, we'll support it however we can. And obviously, you see, we have a lot of uh, trustee volunteers ready to step up and work with you guys. Um, oh, the one other great. thing I did want to, the one other thing I want to say is, you know, it's the, the timing's a little off, but uh, again, going back to that next agenda item, the Envision 2030 process. Um, you know, anything we can do to start getting youth input into that. Uh, you know, we've got public charrettes starting up tomorrow. I think tomorrow night uh, is our first one. So trying to get public input into the various subgroups, uh, you know, everything from government to the environment. So uh, if you guys want to come out and start sharing your your input there, that would be a great first step and uh, as many as your peers as possible. Thank you. Uh, I will also talk to our partners about that as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you guys all so very much. And uh, thanks for coming to, to talk to us this evening. Much appreciated. Thank you. All right. We will move into our discussion items for this evening with that now, uh, <laughs> the Envision 2030 that I've mentioned a couple times. We'll have an update on the vision goals and objectives brought to us by Miranda. Yes, yeah, so tonight I'd like to start with the video that we created um, i did send a link to the board of trustees but i'm going to hopefully figure out how to finally play a video for the board so bear with me one moment thanks to miranda for putting the video together and all the members of the envision yes. board who came out to do the recording recording the audio for it and working so hard on the text and and the content agreed i echo that so i'm gonna play this and if for some reason you can't hear it mayor larson will you shout out at me Thank you for joining us for the Envision 2030 presentation. In this video, we will be outlining the proposed vision statement, goals, and objectives for the town of Netherland over the next 10 years. After reviewing the presentation, we encourage you to provide us with any feedback, comments, questions, or recommendations. Please visit the town of Netherland website for more information regarding the ways that you can provide feedback, including the dates, times, and meeting access information. The arts, culture, and education vision is to celebrate our community's creativity and natural and cultural resources while empowering lifelong learning. Goals and objectives for art. Netherland offers diverse opportunities for creative experiences, including performance, visual, and literary arts. Support and promote public art, prioritizing local artists. Foster public and private relationships to encourage local events. Promote the community center auditorium to include and expand live theater, film, dance, spoken word, concerts, and other performance arts. Maintain budget for and grow exhibition spaces throughout town with an eye towards ADA compliance. Prioritize local artists for the creation of maps, interpretive guides, signage, etc., partnering with the DDA, ProSAB, Public Works, nonprofits, and local businesses whenever possible. Culture, goals and objectives. Create an attractive, unique cultural identity for Netherland that defines us as an economically and culturally diverse town, united in our vision of preserving our local ecosystem and the ability of longtime locals to remain financially solvent and to remain in their mountain homes. Embrace diversity and encourage community interaction in an effort to represent new and old perspectives throughout projects. Celebrate the uniqueness of our location, nestled in the Roosevelt National Forest, 
and our respect of the natural environment as good stewards. Continue the use of alternatives to flashing lights, stoplights, and traffic control signals that tarnishes the surrounding beauty. Support independent local businesses that add cultural uniqueness. Make it a goal to be a dark sky town. Exhibit historical photographs, articles, and artifacts throughout town, engaging students in project development when possible. Outreach to peak to peak communities, including them and their stories in retelling history. For instance, a peak to peak historical trail where art, artifacts, storytelling, events, and so on are represented in each town where we share individual stories which connect us all. Publish an interactive, lively website representing arts, culture, and education, completed in stages, eventually representing the peak to peak region, which includes town events. Education, goals and objectives. The Netherlands area provides opportunities for learning across ages, cultures, and socioeconomic backgrounds. Provide opportunities for mentorship and intergenerational interactions. Join the Boulder Initiative to recognize tribal stewardship and engage area indigenous individuals in the creation of cultural events. Create opportunities for youth to actively, actively engage in Town of Netherland goals and projects. Improve the Mountain School experience and attract new students by collaborating with the Boulder Valley School District, CDOT, and other agencies to design and construct safe trails and highway crossings to and from schools. Expand Netherland's cultural and historic awareness through art and cultural initiatives. This could include strategically located information boards along trails, along with event and art projects depicting historical Netherlands events. Financially support traditional festivals like Miners Days and Pow Wow. Community engagement fosters trust and encourages participation. It is inclusive, interactive, and results in innovative partnerships. The goals and objective of community engagement are to build lasting collaborations by utilizing a broad spectrum of crowdsourcing, both low and high tech, while creating long-term allies to improve overall town project success and awareness. To create better communication to improve community town project knowledge, i.e. what the Board of Trustees are voting on, what the DDA is working on, what the current hot topics are, and so forth. To involve town partnerships and engage teams to mobilize resources which serve as catalysts to assist in the success of individual projects, to increase resident and visitor awareness by creating an environment of inclusion, provide individuals opportunity to advocate their ideas, offer a format to gather advice and guidance, and to ensure an open, trustworthy, and credible process, and to create an easy to navigate town webpage. Netherland is a model community for environmental sustainability. What that means is our community is knowledgeable about how our everyday decisions impact the earth. We take action to mitigate adverse effects of climate change. And we are dedicated to conserve, preserve, protect, and restore our environment to foster a sustainable future that leads to social and economic improvements in our community. So under environmental sustainability, we have eight primary goals. First one is the climate goal. We achieve carbon neutrality and become more resilient to the effects of climate change. We'll do that by reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 50% 50, 50 below 2005 levels, which also is the state 2030 goal. We'll support climate change preparedness and climate adaption and resilience. We ensure that carbon neutrality and resiliency efforts are available to all in the community. And we'll offer education on the effects of climate change and the actions taken to reverse and mitigate it. Our next goal is an ecological health goal, which is to preserve and restore healthy and vibrant ecosystems for all inhabitants. We'll do this through encouraging the use of native vegetation on public and private lands, 
reducing the use of toxic synthetic herbicides and pesticides, protect riparian habitats and natural drainage ways, encourage the protection of environmentally sensitive areas, support expanded use of community forestry sort yards, promote wildlife mitigation on private property with support from wildlife partners, revise and update building design standards to improve resiliency to wildfires, provide equitable support for improving the environmental health of private properties, and provide and distribute ecology education and information on how individuals can support healthy ecosystems and create defensible spaces. Our next goal is our economy goal, which is to support a diverse local economy that encourages green businesses and business practices. We'll do this by supporting local businesses and attracting and expanding green industry and clean tech jobs. And by attracting businesses to diversify and localize the economy, by improving sustainability of the town of Netherlands procurements, by providing support for local and green businesses owned by low-income households, and by offering education on green businesses and business practices. Our next goal is our energy and buildings goal, which is to foster building practices that encourage energy and water efficiency while supporting building electrification and moving away from natural gas and other fossil fuels in the matter. We'll do this by achieving 100% renewable electric energy for municipal, commercial, and residential properties. Currently, we are actually at 38%. New buildings will reach net zero energy and existing buildings will be made as energy efficient as possible. We'll increase water conservation in buildings, revise and update building design standards to include sustainability, support low income populations with subsidies for energy efficiencies, renewable energy and water efficiencies, incorporate sustainable practices into the design and construction of town infrastructure and offer education on renewable energy and energy and water efficiency. Our next goal is a local food and agriculture goal, which is to support local food production and encourage sustainable agricultural practices on publicly owned and private lands. We'll do this by identifying barriers and opportunities for local food production, support community and private food gardens, encourage the use of regenerative agricultural practices, nurture relationships among local producers, distributors, and potential buyers, increase the accessibility of local food for our vulnerable populations, and offer education and outreach on local food and agriculture. Our next goal is our transportation goal, which is to promote the use of alternative transportation and fuel efficient vehicles in order to decrease emissions while maintaining or expanding mobility for town residents, employees, and visitors. We'll do this by supporting electric vehicle or EV adoption and charging stations for all community members, by supporting car and van pooling and shuttles, by increasing the level of walking and bicycling, by providing infrastructure that is accessible and connects neighborhoods, schools, shopping, places of employment, transit, and public spaces, by offering education and outreach on alternative transportation and fuel efficient vehicles, and by supporting ADA accessibility wherever possible. Our next goal is our water goal, which is to preserve the natural environment in our watershed and provide a reliable, high-quality water supply that protects our public health. We will do this by protecting the wildlife habitat, the stream system functions, and the aesthetics of our natural environment while providing recreational access, by understanding and preventing contamination of water sources, by employing and incentivizing water conservation methods, by supporting water reuse, such as gray water reuse, by supporting rainwater harvesting, and by providing education on water conservation practices. Our final goal is a zero waste goal, which is to reduce landfill waste while finding ways to reuse, recycle, and compost discarded materials. We'll do this by moving towards zero waste. Our goal is about an 85% diversion, which is also the City of Boulder's 2025 target. And currently, we're at around 50%. 
We'll also do this by implementing policies that which support waste diversions and eliminate single-use plastics, by reducing our overall consumption, by reducing the amount of toxic materials purchased and increasing safe disposal, and by providing education on ways to reduce waste. The vision statement for health, human, and social services is, in 2030, all peak-to-peak -peak community residents have accessible and affordable health care and human services. The goals of health care are to provide a full spectrum of medical services to our community, to provide access to medical care serving all peak-to-peak -peak communities, such as, but not limited to, primary care, urgent care, testing, imaging, women's care, vaccination, pharmacy, physical therapy, ophthalmology, dental care, psychological services. Services can also meet other needs of residents, such as late evening and weekend hours. Transportation is affordable and available for appointments and triage urgent care needs. The goal of human services is to establish a comprehensive human services facility and network. By maintaining and sustaining a collaborative network of nonprofit and governmental human service providers to provide access to a range of human services, such as, however not limited to, food pantry with community garden and greenhouse, winter clothing closet, family resource center, in addition to affordable support services for home care, in-home hospice, group child care, mediation services for those needing negotiating support, vocational training programs, flourishing schools and education for future generations. Ensure agencies and organizations accept Medicaid, Medicare, and have an affordable sliding scale. Ensure home care services and in-home hospice care services will come up to the peak-to-peak -peak communities. It will accept Medicaid, Medicare, and have an affordable sliding scale. Affordable transportation is available for appointments. And peak-to-peak -peak communities will support families with children and will provide a safe, healthy, and thriving environment. Netherland housing meets the social, economic, and environmental needs of the community now and in the future. Housing goals. Allow for the construction of housing to meet the needs of our local population through commercial lodging and residential housing. Develop public-private partnerships that promote affordability to provide housing for the elderly those living with disabilities, the local workforce, veterans, and other vulnerable populations. Encourage housing that enhances and builds community. Consider the financial challenges on low-income seniors who are aging in place. Provide an opportunity for local housing with dignity for our local population. Establish a timeline for housing that plans for present and future growth. Get public input by following the Envision 2030 process for public engagement and a vote at a regularly scheduled election if necessary on local preferences for annexations, infill, increasing height and density in the commercial business district, overlay districts, or zoning modifications. Housing objectives. Meet goals for housing through affordable housing incentives and options, code updates, and IGA agreements, and partnerships with private and public entities. Provide incentives for developers to design and build livable, affordable, and low-income housing to accommodate seniors, low-income individuals, including veterans, and those living with disabilities. Density or height increase in exchange for a percentage of affordable or senior units. Amortize permit and tap fees or reduce fees to encourage adequate, equitable, and alternative housing solutions. Builders who offer a percentage of housing under a flex rent schedule may qualify for these incentives by offering a decreasing discount incentives to help newcomers work their way into the community. Find ways to monitor and ensure that incentivized housing is meeting stated goals. Update and adopt local building codes. Clarify and revise and code what constitutes a dwelling unit. Revisit recent code revisions 
which prohibit traditional Netherland options, such as RV parking on private land, tiny homes, and homes which do not follow IRC code. Allow for dwellings with low environmental impact, such as, but not limited to, straw bale, hempcrete, yurts, seasonal use of teepees, and so on. Revisit the additional dwelling unit and short-term rental ordinances and determine if they have had the desired effect of creating affordable housing. How new buildings constructed under the code have affected neighborhoods as well as any cost advantage or disadvantage that has resulted. Explore the creation of a Netherland Housing and Land Trust to provide opportunities for future housing needs for affordable, low-income, and workforce locals. For municipal government, Netherlands government uses all the tools at its disposal to provide progressive and exemplary leadership administration through transparency, creativity, dedication, and responsiveness to the needs and goals of the entire community. In translate, translating that into tangible goals, Netherland will determine what is best for the town and will make decisions about home rule. Netherland will continue to digitize and sort records. Netherland will partner in redevelopment with landowners to update aging infrastructure. Netherland will leverage money in the bank to make more money in the form of interest. Netherland will implement the community uh, center master plan and fix issues at the community center. Netherland will update and change zoning, the zoning map to reflect reality. Netherland will update and or exit the IGA with Boulder County. Our team also worked on economic development vision and goals. Netherland thrives in a healthy, diversified, long-term sustainable community that prioritizes the needs of its citizens while protecting and leveraging its precious natural setting. And the goals that support our economic development vision, Netherland will update and change town code that is currently ambiguous and outdated. Netherland code will allow for 50 foot high buildings in downtown for density and that'll include uh, sloped roofs. Netherland will build another bridge that extends Snyder Street South and connects with Conger. Netherland will repair the building at the southeast corner of the RTD site. Netherland will determine how to best create a town square at the visitor center parking lot. Netherland will examine parking and traffic strategies to optimize visitors. Netherland will replace and repair infrastructure while development takes place on adjoining parcels. Netherland will work to make ADU and low income housing more economical and easier to build. Netherland will determine how to connect existing trails in places that are being redeveloped. Netherland will have a vision and a plan for two, two downtown areas that are likely to change hands soon. Parks, recreation, and open space. Our community and its visitors enjoy ecologically sound and well-maintained parks, open space, and trails with recreational and cultural services and facilities while protecting and enhancing the unique mountain ecosystem of which we are a part. Overall goal. Netherlands' unique and stunning setting in the natural world informs our planning and maintenance. We honor and maintain the land and surroundings as environmental stewards. We provide opportunities for residents of the greater Netherland area to live, play, interact, learn, and flourish in a walkable, attractive, and well-planned town. Objectives. Address funding and staffing needs to, for Netherland parks, recreation, open space, and trails. Prost, including current inventory and costs in order to create a more sustainable system. Endeavor to follow the principles of the Sustainable Sites Initiative or similar sustainability guidelines in the implementation of all projects to the greater extent possible in order to promote sustainable land development and management practices. Endeavor to preserve, conserve, and restore environmental resources such as environmental conservation areas, terrestrial and riparian habitat connectors, critical ha wildlife habitats, wildlife migration corridors, wetlands and riparian areas. 
pay particular attention to the recreational needs of youth, the future of our society, and seniors, a rapidly expanding demographic. Seek to make facilities ADA compliant to increase accessibility of public facilities. Ensure that all Nederland Prost facilities are adequately maintained in order to support the environmental, social, and economic goals of the community. Recognize the vulnerability of the Nederland area and its Prost assets to wildfire and proactively plan to reduce risks through best practices in ecological health and wildfire mitigation. Make Prost-related community outreach and education a priority to promote a well-informed public as laid out by Public Engagement and Vision 2030. Consider parking, bicycle, and pedestrian needs for Prost assets and encourage sustainable transportation at all Prost facilities. This parks goal. Parks are maintained and planned as spaces for people to respectfully engage with nature and each other in balance with residents' needs for recreation, social gathering places, and local and regional cultural events on a scale that is appropriate for the size and character of the town. Objectives. Implement the Gateway Park Area Master Plan in order to expand social and recreational op opportunities and enhance environmental stewardship. The park is officially called Barker Meadows Park. Continue to create and implement management plans for all town parks to enhance sustainable operations. Address erosion, manage overuse, trash management, including hazardous fishing waste and dog waste. Use be best practices for environmental sustainability when designing and creating parks. Native planting, low water use, wildlife needs. Recreation goal. Nederland area recreational activities and programs address the expressed recreational needs and preferences of the Nederland area community and promote healthy, active, and culturally rich experiences in alignment with a deep respect for nature and commitment to environmental stewardship and education. Objectives. Evaluate and optimize the use of the community center, securing ongoing and adequate funding to accommodate more of the community's recreation goals. Evaluate requests for new recreational programs and facilities. Explore public and private partnerships to maximize and leverage resources. Support a mix of recreational and cultural activities and programs responsive to the interests and needs of the Nederlandarian residents. Open Space Goal. The Netherland community's desire for open space preservation is recognized by creative pursuit of land preservation and opportunities that arise with a priority placed on preserving sensitive natural resources, view sheds, and riparian areas, and by responsible management of the town's open space property. Objectives. Establish processes to acquire desirable open space property in order to pursue land preservation opportunities. Develop sustainability analysis and management plans for current town-owned open space property that emphasize best practices for ecosystem functionality, wildlife habitat, stormwater management by use of natural passive systems, water, natural resources, and current land use data, forest floor and soil health, wildfire mitigation, site appropriate public access. Trails goal. The Nederland area trail system provides safe, accessible, and well-maintained pathways which are left as much as possible in their natural state. This system links Netherlands commercial district, neighborhoods, schools, area parks, habitat, recreational facilities, and regional trails, fosters well-being, and provides opportunities for alternative transportation. Objectives. Update the 2005 Town of Netherlands Trail Master Plan to guide enhancements to the trail system. 
identify resources for effective trails planning, construction, and maintenance to enhance connectivity while minimizing erosion and avoiding critical habitat and sensitive wildlife corridors. Create and implement an information campaign to educate users to respect neighborhoods, habitat, and wildlife. Improve trail safety to promote community walkability, health, and alternative transportation. Continue working with surrounding public and private landholders for increased linkages to area trails and attractions to increase trail connectivity and usage. Develop trail along the western shoreline of Barker Reservoir with sensitivity towards both public needs for water access and preservation of riparian habitat in order to promote healthy lifestyles and environmental awareness and stewardship. Thank you again for joining us. Please leave any feedback, comments, questions, or recommendations in the comments section on YouTube or visit the Envision 2030 website to provide feedback. All right, I'm glad that worked. Okay, I just wanna echo Mayor Larson in thanking the Envision 2030 Advisory Committee. They've done a ton of work um, preparing this document. So before I turn it over to the Board of Trustees, I just wanna quickly go over the public outreach components. We have provided nine ways for the community to get involved in Envision 2030. So what you just watched is a YouTube video that we created. It has been officially uploaded onto YouTube and people can leave comments there. In addition, we have in-person public charrettes scheduled, which are on the calendar I provided, as well as the virtual public charrettes where all of the topics will be discussed. We also have subcommittee specific charrettes where if someone maybe is just interested in housing, they could come to that subcommittee specific event. We have everything uploaded onto our town website and this QR code that you see on uh, the screen is how you would, you can scan that and it'll take you right to the website. We also have an opportunity for people to come to town hall and look at a binder we've created and leave feedback here. All the advisory boards and commissions will receive the link and the documents to review and discuss at their meetings. And we've also created a really neat program called Gathered Town, which Mayor Larson had brought to our attention. And it's an online social site where the users can create an avatar and interact with one another. So we created our own Gather Town space that is specific to Envision 2030. And so when you enter into the site, you can walk around the different rooms and give your feedback. So we do encourage the community to attend any of the events they can or participate in any of the ways they can. We are running advertisements in the Mountaineer every weekend or every week, and we're also having stories and articles. So before the board today is really, we're asking you to provide us with any feedback you might have on what we just watched. Um, we've got members of the Envision 2030 group here, but otherwise we can also take your comments and bring them back to the board. And we're also just curious if you have any questions about the public outreach plan. Mayor Larson, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Miranda. Uh, great video, great great way to condense all those meetings into uh, a 30 minute video. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, we've got a calendar of events coming up here for the next month of subcommittee meetings and opportunities for the public to come and really weigh in on either the overall goal visions of these committees or the specific goals that the subcommittees have identified as potential inclusions in the Envision 2030 process. So I really hope it's gonna lead to a lot of public uh, engagement over the next month. I know we've already started getting some comments from different sources in the last couple of days, and I, want, I hope that really continues to grow. Um, so I'll just open this up. I'll go through um, Board of Trustees. If you have questions or comments or thoughts, I know each trustee member is a, uh, liaison to one of the uh, our advisory boards, which will be seeing this, the Envision 2030 goals and visions this month. So you'll have another opportunity to weigh in there. So lots of chances, uh, and we'll just we'll go reverse order this time and begin with Tanya. Uh, I don't really have a lot of questions. I think it's a 
pretty good presentation and uh, lots of different opportunities for the public to engage. So um, I would recommend that people watch that video or at least if they're like a, a PowerPoint of the main points for each of the each of the categories. Yeah, so we also have this document called the Vision Statement Goals and Objectives, and it takes everything from that video and lays it out in written format. So we're just trying oh, to make nice. people. Yeah, and all the yeah, that have. would be. I mean, a really good get to get that out somehow so people could read that before they go to the meeting. Mm -hmm. yep. I think that would be good. This is on the website as well. There's a link to it right at the top. There and is. To okay. your point, when someone signs up, they do have to RSVP for any meeting we have just to make sure that whether it's in person, we're socially distanced, or we don't want to host a meeting if no one comes. If they RSVP, they get a copy of this as well and the link to the YouTube video. So there's lots of ways to read and absorb the information. Okay. And I guess the other question was, I didn't know uh, that we were liaisons. I don't know who I'm a liaison with, which group. I don't remember that. Well, and I think for that, um, Trista Corvalin, my plan is to actually send this to Ben after the, the meeting and the Communities That Care Coalition. Um, we'd like to try to get as many external agencies as possible to review it, and we're happy to come present at any of their meetings. And so my assumption okay. would be that's where you would be able to engage even further on this. Well, and I also meant, you know, we have the, the Board of Zoning Adjustments is meeting is on Thursday, which I know they're going to be looking at Envision 2030, the Planning Commission, SAB, uh, ProSAB, uh, all of those are town advisory boards are each going to be weighing in on this as well. And that's what the li liaison comment I meant. Ah, okay. Gotcha. And also on, but I missed something. On that point, too, you know, I know we kind of threw a ton at the board, and so we are doing this all month long, and if Board of Trustee members feel like they need more time to sit with this information, you can give us feedback on the website, you can email it to me, you can comment on the YouTube video. There's so many different formats to share your feedback that if it doesn't come to you all right now, you can do it in, in a different way. You know what, I'd be curious to know uh, regarding uh, the Envision 2020, how many of those uh, milestones or goals were we able to to reach, I'm just curious, like if there's some sort of a document that outlines 2020 and where we succeeded in that, just so like people can see that this isn't just, you know, just wishful thinking that it's, this is all could happen. Uh, yeah, our advisory committee, the Envision 2030 advisory committee did discuss that at one of our early meetings, uh, we did not necessarily come up with a full document, but we could take the feedback from that meeting and prepare something and put it on the website. Yeah, I don't want to give you any more work. I'm just, I mean, it would be, if there were a handful, it would be nice to highlight it. Yeah. Um, just so people don't think, well, what's the point? Nothing ever happens. It's like, no, we did do these and it does matter what you say now. Um, anyway, that's just my two cents. Awesome, thanks. Thank you, Tanya. Lindsay. Yeah, I just want to say thank you to everybody who participated in, in all of these charrettes so far. And, and um, I think this document that's been put together is, is really great. Uh, and I look forward to working with BZA on this um, later this week. The only thing um, I was wondering, and I think this is aimed at, at town staff maybe, is, is it normal for this you know, envision statements to have very specific goals. I mean, some of them seem oddly specific to me. Um, like saying Netherland code will allow for 50 foot high buildings. It, it seems strange to put that kind of stuff in there rather than just say taller buildings. Um, is this normal to do it this yeah, way? So some of the advisory, uh, the subcommittees um, did become a little bit more specific. I will tell you, as noted here in the next steps, once we have feedback on the vision and goals, the really the next step is to make them specific targets, performance measures, projects. And so some committees may have just gone ahead a little bit. Um, obviously, if the community doesn't agree on that goal or, or they have recommendations, we'd love to hear that. But it would be a part of the next step. Okay. Yeah. It's just yeah. Some of those things are. It would seem like well, the goal could be 
allow for taller buildings and it may be determined that 50 feet isn't the optimal, maybe it's 48 or maybe it's 55, you know. It, it just seems kind of arbitrary to say that's our goal and that's our, our measurement for success is this particular thing, um, which seems odd for a, an envision, a vision for our future. But um, yeah, I mean, but yeah, thanks, thanks everyone for your hard work on this. Yeah, thanks for that feedback. We did receive similar feedback um, on, on a social media post. And so that has been shared with the group that maybe ended up a bit more specific. And so it'll be something for them to consider as they go back and adjust the vision goals and objectives. Uh, as noted in this next step, this will all come back to the Board of Trustees on May 18th for final adoption. So what you see tonight is likely going to be adjusted based on all the feedback received. Thanks, Lindsay. Sounds good. Julian. Uh, no, thank you, everyone, for doing this. It's an excellent presentation. I'm, I've been, uh, I've read through it, and I am still cogitating it. It looks good generally, though. I don't have any objections or concerns at this point. Julian, Jonathan. Uh, no objections, comments, really, or concerns. Just want to thank all the volunteers for putting all this effort in. Uh, it's a long process, and I'm looking forward to seeing kind of the next step of discussions now that we have some general goals and ideas or some very specific goals and ideas. So thank you all, and looking forward to see how this continues to develop. Thanks, Jonathan. Eric. Yeah, thanks everybody for putting for putting this together. I know that those committees have been uh, working quite hard and I've had the pleasure of attending some of them uh, and seeing the work that folks are doing. So I'm uh, happy to see it come before us today. Uh, I do want to echo uh, Trustee Danforth's uh, sort of concerns about some of the specificity of some of these ideas. Um, I almost feel like under where it says next steps that specific objectives should be removed. I'm not sure that a vision is a place for specific objectives um, at all, in fact. And I think that I, I love that we have all of the all of these ideas that uh, the community has thrown out there uh, to be considered uh, by the, the broader public. And I think that those are great ideas to be considered. But when it comes to crafting what a vision for the town will be, uh, that eventually we're going to have to synthesize those into uh, more general ideas about uh, how we want Netherland to look and feel and how we want uh, the town to serve the community. And so I would really hope that folks start to think about maybe that kind of synthesis aspect of it, maybe uh, backing away from some of these very ultra specific ideas and uh, more generally uh, trying to come up with a vision that we can all get on board with because some of these very specific ideas are not things that everyone is gonna agree on and I think that what's really important about a vision statement is that we, we come together around something that we can actually agree on, even if the way we get there is not something we all uh, at this moment uh, perfectly align with. So I really hope that that's the way that we move forward on this. Thank you, Eric. Ellen. I just want to say, uh... Wow, I'm amazed at how much feedback we've had and had it so much uh, condensed and synthesized in a time of COVID. That's the most amazing thing. And, you know, the uh, Environmental Sustainability Subcommittee, the, the goals they laid out and some of their things were very congruent with what the Sustainability Advisory Board has been working on. So I see a lot of overlap and agreement. And I see echoes of the previous plan. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'm, I was actually pretty pleased to see that, you know, sustainability was a really important goal of the previous plan. And we did achieve a bunch of those goals. And it is still part and parcel of what we're trying to do as a community. So I see a lot more agreement than disagreement. And I'm very encouraged by this. And uh, I think the boards and commissions will have time to sort through some of these specific objectives and maybe read them out and we'll get hopefully more feedback from the community. So 
thank you to the volunteers and thank you to staff for creating a great uh, process. Mayor Larson, if you're there, you might be muted. I'm assuming you're probably I, there. Thank I'm you. doing that so many times tonight. I'm, yeah, well, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to thank thank everyone again um, and wanted to turn this over, get some public comment uh, as the first chance people from the general public have heard of this, uh, but this is just kicking off those uh, opportunities beginning with tomorrow night, the virtual public charrette from 6 to 8 p.m. So hopefully we'll start, this is the first of many opportunities, but uh, anyone who would like to speak on it now would be your chance. I can have up to three minutes. If you catch my eye, start speaking up. Uh, reminder to those uh, calling users we have on the phone, if you are muted, star six will unmute you so that you can speak. And I will start scanning for anyone who'd like to speak now. Not hearing or seeing anyone. We'll bring it back to the board. Uh, Miranda, do you have any final announcements on this? No, I would just ask that um, people continue to participate. We're sending out reminders. The big thing is just that you have to RSVP for virtual or in-person charrettes. So I would just ask, it's very easy to do on our website, which is a quick clickable form. We'll send you the meeting access links and all the information, but that's just helpful to know who's who's going to join us uh, and just ask that you participate in, in the nine different ways you can. All right. Thank you, Miranda. Thank you to all the members of the Envision 2030 committee that put in the hard work and uh, looking forward to starting the public comments tomorrow night. Next on our discussion this evening is uh, another update on the building codes. And I think we're gonna break this into a couple different pieces because we have several several little pieces to discuss. We'll um, have Miranda introduce it in individual pieces and have discussion on each one to try and keep it kind of efficient and orderly so we don't get confused about what, uh, what we're trying to talk about tonight. So Miranda. Yes. Thanks, Mary Larson. So back in March, we came before you with SafeBuilt to do a presentation on the changes of the 2012 building code versus 2018. We had let you all know that our plan was to do some public charrettes and feedback with advisory boards and commissions, which we did throughout March. What we found though in completing those different outreach sessions is that really it would be ideal to let Envision flesh out. Ultimately there are goals as you saw in Envision, especially with regards to code, that we need to see how the, the community feels about, and it didn't make sense to adopt a building code that maybe was separate or different from that envision. So therefore we are recommending adjusting a timeline where we would ideally implement any building code changes in January, 2022. So here's the timeline we're proposing. Between April and July, our administrative committee will continue to work on looking at code updates and doing research specifically related to costs, because that's a big area of concern for people. We'll then do another round of public charrettes in August, 2021. And at that point would we'll focus on really getting feedback about the specific code changes. Then in September, we would make any additional changes as needed based on that feedback. In October, we would introduce the ordinance to the board of trustees with a goal of adopting in November so we could implement it on January 1st, 2022. So the first question before the board is, do you support this amended timeline? All right, um, <laughs> board comments on this, Julian? The timeline looked fine to me. Okay, Lindsay? Good to me. Eric? It's all right to me. Tanya? Yeah, looks good. Alan? 
Yeah, I, th I think it uh, it looks fine. I, I guess I have a question. Um, and that is, you know, under the pros and cons, and maybe we sh I should wait to ask this question when we get there. But, you know, the statement is made that if we adopt the 2018 code, we're behind because because the current code is 2021. Is it is it the feeling that adopting the current code is too much of a leap from 2012 to 2021? Yeah, I was going to get to that next unless Mayor Larson was ready for me to touch on it now. Uh, let's let's I'm, let's just get Jonathan's input on the schedule, okay. and then we can go straight to that because I think that's the last one. I like the new timeline. I think it's uh, intelligent to see how 2030 pans out, um, particularly with some of the community goals there. So all for it. All right. Yep. I think we all agree on that then. So yeah, uh, referencing Alan's question about the jump from 2018 versus 2021. So when we met with Safebelt to let them know we were amending our timeline or we're proposing to, they had discussed with us maybe some of the pros and cons of going rather than adopting 2018 and looking at 2021. And so there are pros and cons to both. And we have provided those to you here. Um, there's 2018 pros and cons and 2021. So trustee app to answer your question, one concern with adopting 2018, it just means we'll always be behind versus an adoption of 2021. We're then, you know, obviously in alignment with the most current code. However, the first bullet point here, by adopting 2018, there is an acknowledgement that it's on its third edition. You know, with every code cycle, they're going to make amendments. And so we know that 2018 is relatively established versus 2021, mm -hmm. we don't, the books haven't been released yet. Um, so we just have kind of some initial information of what those codes look like. Now there also are some pros though to 2021. A lot of that, it could be energy, related. Um, again, we listed them all here, but they, it does further energy cold, which is a big priority of the community and does get us in alignment with current codes. Boulder County is looking to go to 2021 so we could align with them. So again, a series of pros and cons to both. And what we're looking for is for the Board of Trustees to let us know, do you want us to continue with 2018 as we have been? Or do you feel it's appropriate to start looking at 2021 instead? And how, was this pro and con taken to our advisory boards? It is not. Did they have a discussion to that? It is not. So that could, if that's a desire of the board, since April through July is that kind of our exploratory time frame, we could take this to all the boards and commissions and come back to the board of trustees in May with their feedback. Right. Uh, yeah, my, that was my next question is, how soon do we really need to make a decision on this? Or is there a chance to do more sort of outreach to, um, well, looking at Jonathan, I'll call on next here, you know, our local building trades and local contractors um, to do some more outreach to, to help us guide this decision? Or do we need to actually make a decision tonight whether to pursue 18 or 21? I don't feel we need to make a decision tonight. I mean, obviously, I think we would want to land on something by early summer so the administrative team had enough time to dive deep into whatever code year we choose. Um, but if we wanted to commit the next month and a half, say, to exploring pros and cons more with advisory boards, commissions, and the community, we could absolutely do that. Okay. Jonathan, instead of calling you next. Yeah, um, you know, personally, I would definitely just say if we're going to update the codes at all, we should only go to the 2018. I don't like the idea that jumping to 2021 building codes is getting up to date necessarily in the building industry. A lot of the times that the codes are updated, they have a review process, which is normally two to three years. So to say that 2018 codes would not actually be current, I, I would disagree with you there. Um, maybe so Field has told you that, but I don't necessarily look at building codes as, oh, we just produced this state of, you know, the, the latest and greatest. They have some things that always need to be worked out. So I lean toward the 2018 if we're gonna update, but I would like 
town staff to do a little bit more research and particularly pull out what are the updates that are different in the 2021 code as compared to the 2018. It's probably largely going to be energy efficiency and uh, building materials. So that's kind of my, my input there that I would like to see us reach out a little bit more and more so than just this administrative community, as the mayor said, actually reach out to our contractors and see if we can't pull in two to three of some of our local contractors in town to have input on this 2021 potential. I'm pretty well against it. I'll stand on that. And I do want to just comment on that. So Rick Hendrickson is on the call. So he has worked with a handful of contractors. Um, I don't believe we've had that discussion about 2021, but they are aware that this, these discussions are happening. And so we're happy to reconnect with them as well about this. Thanks, Brenda. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, Tanya. Um, I was curious when we were talking about this earlier and uh, Rick Henderson was here and was really encouraging us to change the code update it where we were, we were referring to at that point 2018 correct in correct yeah but when we first so, presented this in march it was 2018. so in the 2018 code there there is changes in the materials used for the roofing and siding as so it is helping with the fire no that's the wildland urban interface which is the next discussion on this agenda it's a separate oh. code that was part of the 2018 code when we adopted it in 2016 we amended it as the bot the bot of that time to not put the wildland urban interface building requirements on residential buildings only commercial buildings Rick is suggesting to us that that was a mistake that we should require them on residential buildings, but I believe that's the next discussion. That's the next, but because it says here that the 21 code is more efficient with fire and, um, wait, I gotta go to the bigger copy, uh, more alignment with fire safety, energy efficiency goals. So 2018 doesn't really have a whole lot of that, but we're gonna, if we add the wildland interface, then that will solve that. Maybe every code update is pretty much an improvement on things that they've learned. Spark arresters, electric, the electric code's a really good idea to update. It's a matter of when any municipal body updates these codes, they, as the governing body, have the ability to amend these codes. Um, if we move to the 2018, we'd have the ability to amend the code. You can look and you can see that the city of Boulder has adopted the WUI, International Building Code of 2018, but they have amended all the requirements in there to match the rest of the city's municipal building code. So that would be my suggestion if we are going to add the, the YUC into residence that we take time to amend it. But again, this is the next discussion. Right, well, what is the sunset clause? So the sunset clause is that if the board of trustees or the town adopted 2021, we could add in a clause where every three years when the new code comes out, the town almost automatically adopts a new set of codes. It would allow the town to make amendments, um, but it would always keep us with the current code year and so in 2024 town would naturally move to that with with any changes needed gotcha and you can't do that with 2018 because you're already behind right right okay thanks um i guess i'm still thinking about it i don't have a, a strong opinion on it right now so you're thinking it'd be good for the town administrative council to keep working on the differences between 18 and 21 and get feedback and bring this back for us. Yeah, I, mean, I couldn't possibly make a choice right now. I, I'm certainly, I mean, Jonathan knows more about this stuff than I do for sure. But I mean, my instinct is like we should be with the most current, the most new, because that's my instinct. But if it's not reasonable, then that's a whole other issue. Yeah. Thanks, Tanya. Alan? Yeah, I think that. Uh... My main concern would be value for the buyer and being reasonable with our 
uh, building com builder community, uh, you know, implement something like energy efficiency, there's more upfront cost, but it saves a homeowner uh, a lot of money over time and you get the payback. And so I think that should be our one of our primary goals and it's a sustainability goal. You know, the whole wildfire thing has really hit everybody between the eyes. Uh, we are a threatened area and a lot of people have lost their homes in Colorado in the past year. So if we can uh, address that cost effectively and protect some homeowners, I think it protects them and it protects us. But there is the, the issue of cost. Uh, so I think those are the things we need to look at, uh, in my opinion. So I think in terms of the 2018 versus 2021, I look for more information from staff and from the local community and see what are the advantages and disadvantages. And it sounds like it's premature to go for 20, 2021 right now. We don't have, we have limited information, but it makes a great deal of sense to look at uh, adopting 2018. So that's my impression right now. Thanks, Eric. Alan, Eric. Yeah, it seems to me that um, trying to jump from 2012 to 2021 or, or whatever it is uh, that we're at now is quite a large leap. And I'm not sure that building and renovations will, will necessarily, um, you know, keep up with that if we do try to adopt the absolute cutting edge newest version of the code that really isn't tried and tested and I do think it, my gut sort of says that we should really be looking at the 20, 2018 building code and maybe looking at the 2021 code mostly for potentially some inspirations for specific amendments we could make to the 2018 code that pertain to our situation up here. Um, that being wildfire or maybe some maybe other issues that are that are that are found in the 2021 code where they address something that they didn't in the 2018 code that we could implement now. Uh, rather than implementing 2021 wholesale. And I would just like to say, I also would very much uh, support including Wui in the, re in the residential building code as well. I think that's a good idea. I think it makes sense, especially because we are a wildland urban interface. Uh, so I'd like to see that happen. Thanks, Eric. Lindsay. Sorry, took me a minute to find my mute button. Um, so I personally like being, you know, following the newer recommendations. So I, I think having the town look at the 2021 building codes um, is a great idea. And if we can amend things specifically, you know, tailor them to our circumstances, then why wouldn't we just adopt, you know, look, look at adopting the 2021 so we're as current as we possibly can be, um, and then amend the few things that, that you know we think aren't pertinent for our town or wouldn't work with our goals. Um, so for me, um, I don't want to always be you know five versions behind and everything. Um, and as a town, you know I think we have a lot of goals of trying to be, you know, better and the best at things. Um, and so I think having the, the newer building codes keeps up with that, that idea for us, that vision for us of, of being kind of a leader. So I say the town should keep looking at the 2021. Thanks, Lindsay. Julian. Uh, yeah, I just have a quick question. Uh, would it be possible for the town to establish a policy wherein we adopt the very latest building code when it's two years old. Something like that. That way we could adopt the 2018 now. And we could say in two years, we're going to adopt the 2021 code. And this is all automatic. And that gives builders an opportunity to bone up on the latest code, knowing it's going to go into effect in two years. I mean, the BOT would, of course, be able to review this and amend it as needed. But I'm wondering if that might be a reasonable policy, meaning we're going to let them have two years to get all the kinks worked out, but then we're going to adopt that as a matter of policy. Uh, I, I, I think that might be 
a compromise between we're going to 2018 now and we're going to decide what to do later with 2021. And that is, so that is kind of like the sunset clause. It is possible to write into our, our code that every two years we adopt the next set um, and, and something that town staff can also look into as we continue to, I'm guessing the vibe is to continue to assess 18 versus 21 and we could offer kind of recommendations or thoughts on that. I think that does sound like the the feeling of the board. Um, I think there's su sufficient questions regarding 18 and 21 to have the administrative group work on it a little bit more and get some more input. And uh, we'll take a look at it again uh, early summer. Sounds great. Okay, well, uh, Trustee Kumdismile and Mayor Pro Tem Baumhofer basically introduced the next one, but I'll be quick. <laughs> so as noted, the Wildland Urban Interface Code when adopted was put into the International Building Code, so it applied to commercial structures, but it also needs to be in place for residential structures. So we are recommending that through ordinance adoption, we move that so that it is an amendment to the International Residential Code and therefore applicable to residential structures. In addition to doing that ordinance code change, we also need to do an update to the electrical national electrical code. We recently, we have the adoption of 2014 and we do need to adopt the 2020. So we'd like to come back before the board at the April 20th meeting with that ordinance, with the two minor amendments related to building regulations and are looking to see if the board approves us doing so. And Rick, I don't know if there's anything you wanna to add to that. Yeah, I would like to clarify something there. So actually in 2015-16, when the codes were adopted last, the, the WUI section, the Wildland Urban Interface, was intended to go into the residential code. The section numbers that it has match up with the residential code, not the building code. And it was inadvertently attached to the building code amendment rather than the residential code. The building code already does have some exterior flammability requirements in it, although they're not as stringent as the WUI requirement is. And, and that's something we'd like to do with the next adoption. But as far as the current situation, uh, because it was put in the wrong place, it actually makes it unenforceable for residential the way it is. Uh, it, it was an inadvertent thing. Um, I don't think there was any intent to put it in the building code. Um, it was not numbered that way, as I said, uh, it just, we want to shift it over to where it was supposed to be. And just to be clear, I mean, this is the, the electrical code and the WUI code. There's no reason to keep those in sync with the adoption of the building code. We can do this kind of, you know, there's nothing weird about doing those first and then the building code later this or in January of 2020, uh, 2022. Mm -hmm. No, we did run by attorney Madsen and she said that uh, doing a separate ordinance to make these two minor amendments was appropriate to do so now. Okay. Trustee Taylor, questions, comments, thoughts on the WUI and electrical code issue? No questions. It seems like a reasonable proposal. Okay, so you're also in favor of having that one come back at the at next meeting or coming meeting? Yes. Okay. Yes. Lindsay? Yep, no questions tonight, but I look forward to seeing it on an upcoming agenda. All right. Alan? I agree. Tanya? Uh, I mean, I'd be for ad adopting that quicker than 22. Yeah, that's what we're saying is like the next meeting. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Eric? Yes, I'm in favor. Jonathan. I'd be in favor of updating the electrical code as per state law, we have to and are required to. Um, I, I have some issues still with the WUI. Um, it's been here and I just heard the rest of this board agree to update to a code that 
are you all even aware of what's in this code and what's what this code requires? And I just basically heard Comet say that this isn't a big deal, but as soon as we move Wooey into the, the resident, it actually is a big deal. It requires entirely new material to be put on all the buildings going up. So if we adopted this as of next or two weeks from now, I guess is Cynthia on right now. How many building permits do we currently have out? What type of outreach has been done to contractors who are currently pricing out buildings right now, maybe have buildings already built or on the way? Um, yeah. This this actually does change quite drastically what happens on the exterior structures up here. Yeah. Not so, I think required. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, this is Rick Henriksen again. Um, this is what has been enforced, <clears throat> excuse me, on residential by SafeBuilt since the 2012 codes were uh, enacted because they were under the impression it was in the correct place and enforceable. This is no change from what's already been there. We just discovered that it was placed in the wrong place. Uh, but it's been what the contractors have been going by. And to, to add to that of the current building codes, uh, those plans that have been signed off as, as Rick indicated, do comply. Um, that answer your question, Jonathan? For the time being, I suppose. I mean, this would be. I, yeah. I, I, I would like to see the minutes from when we actually updated the 2016. I remember it being quite a big deal, the arguments at that time, particularly around the fire suppression systems and at what square footage the, the sprinkler systems kick in. You know, you can read the WI, UC, UI and you can see that, okay, 25% of uh, needed replace on a roof then requires these to kick in. So I imagine the little house in Old Town that has a pine tree fall on it. And then all the sun, that pine tree did over 25% damage. Now they need to up their coach to the WIC. The framing doesn't comply with it. Now you need to get into the structural members. You need to get fire treated ply because that house is still surrounded in Old Town. and hits the the requirement for it being a high district so it's i don't have a problem with the intent of these codes i love the intent of codes and i hear what the rest of the trustees are saying about let's get to the latest version what we have to understand is well, this is the town of netherland and you weren't even required to have a gc license in the state of colorado until 2008 which means anybody could build a house so you're not dealing with a bunch of adequate houses or a bunch of houses that are easy. As soon as you up these codes, anybody who goes in to try to fix these houses then has to deal with these new codes and it's an interface. So generally as a, as a municipal body setting these codes, your goal is to try to align them with the building industry in your area. We can sit here and say, we wanna be leaders and be at 2021, but Gilpin County is still at 2015. Okay, so they're a little bit ahead of us at the 2012, but they chose not to go to the 2018, they chose to go to the 2015. So I guess my concern here is we seem to be just pushing to update to the most modern codes. With the electrical, it's required by the state law. That makes sense. Electrical and plumbing are licensed by the state. When it comes to some of these issues in the WUI, it's okay, we talk about being in the wildland urban interface, but you have to consider is requiring somebody to put hardy siding and all of these things on a house in Old Town actually gonna help anything in the event of a forest fire through Old Town? No, not if it's surrounded by four other houses that are historical non-compliant. It's not gonna do anything but require the one person who wants to remodel their house to put a heck of a lot more money into it. So when we talk about these codes, we have to think outside of just our intent for these laws. We legislate based upon intent and end up creating a lot of harm based upon unforeseen circumstances and unintended consequences. So I'm really not for putting this WC. I hear what Rick is saying, but I've also been a part of inspections 
on decks that do not meet these requirements based upon what's there and Safefield has not enforced it probably because what you're saying is they haven't had the ability to enforce it. Now we change this all of a sudden they actually have the ability to enforce it and instead of telling the contractor well it's the town of Netherland you're getting away with that it's no we need these things. I'm not against necessarily acquiring this but reality is we're trying to target the large developments here the large houses places being built in the woods but the unintended consequences you really end up screwing the little guy and the little guy are those people just trying to remodel mayor pro tem baumhofer this is karen garrity i was wondering if you would be willing to be um a liaison or a resource for our uh, building code administrative team and to communicate with us and we could kind of hash this out before we bring it back to um, the board on April 20th, would you be willing to be available for us? I can try to find some time in the schedule during the work day. It's going to be extremely hard right now. We're jumping back into summer, but yeah, I would like to sit down because I'm not against the intent here and I do appreciate the work that's going on and we should be looking to provide more safety for our residents through our codes. But we need to be very careful in this town and recognize what we have. And at some point, we kind of got to get out of this pie in the sky mentality that we can lead in everything in Netherland because we all know what the issues are. Well, so. we welcome you um, on our team, and it would be great to have your insights and help us move this forward in a way that uh, you know you could help us resonate with uh, these these very specific. Uh, concerns that you're bringing up okay well shoot me an email offline about when you guys are going to be next together and i can open up a schedule time because i am concerned about how some of this will affect what's what's currently happening in the building and i would like to see our larger developers be more conscious of this but i'm i'm afraid it's going to have a more drastic effect on the little guys than necessarily who we want to target so i appreciate it so this is julian i have a question uh from mayor pro tem bomb um it, if we were to through policy let everyone know that uh the two-year-old policy the two-year-old code was the one we were going to adopt so everyone had a couple of years to get used to that and then fold in a few exceptions, such as the case you were describing. I mean, we, we would be able to perhaps through ordinance exempt certain types of structures and certain modifications to structures, regardless how much they were damaged. Would, would well, that help at all? See, as, as Rick said, and Miranda keyed in on, all the builders up here are already in tune with 2018 building mm -hmm. codes because mm -hmm. Boulder County requires them. We all work both sure. in Boulder yeah. County. I'm not worried about the builders up here. I'm worried about the homeowners. I'm worried about the fact that the majority of our houses up here, I wouldn't say the majority at this point, but we still have a 30 to 40% of our houses sitting on stone foundations, things that were mm -hmm. built in 1920 through 1950, that the last remodel was 1980. So right. you're talking about taking houses that were built before, you know, 1984 International Building Code was even introduced. And we have to be cognizant of that. And if we have these affordable housing goals, we have to think about where we could potentially enact the, the, the YUC in very specific districts or areas, neighborhoods, Big Springs, for example, Navajo. Mm -hmm. We could leave Old Town out of it. We could leave First Street out of it, Second Street, recognizing that most of these houses on First, Second, Third, and in Old Town they are going to be highly non-compliant. They're all built old, like the discussion we had about the Little Bear PUD. Mm -hmm. um, they're quirky and for very specific reasons. Right. And when you have all these tie-ins, it gets more and more complicated. And what I would, what I'm kind of proposing is our goal here is to make the town safer in the event of a fire while requiring everybody in Old Town to have fire-resistant siding when they build a brand new house and the four cabins around them are about to just fall apart and catch on fire anyway, you're not actually helping anything. You're just penalizing the one person who's building a new house. 
So that's what I'm asking the BOT to be cognizant of is how much is updating this code actually achieving our goal? Or is it just an attempt to legislate with a hope? And the end result is actually going to be more pain for our residents than improvement for the town. And I think this is something government is doing a lot right now is it's trying to virtue signal and push things through legislation. And it's having a backfiring effect. It's taking away people's rights. It's making things harder on individuals. And it's making government overstep its bounds. We should be trying to help folks but not thinking that just by updating to the newest code, we're helping anything. We, we yeah. got to get out of that mindset as a BOT. I, I understand what you're saying. And I'm, I only bring this up because I'm hoping that I may be describing something that you could propose in a write-up rather than necessarily having to show up at all of the various meetings that you've just been invited to. I have some very specific wondering. amendments that I have written up yeah, to the IUC that I'd like to go over with Rick that I think can address my concerns. I think it's about okay. providing opportunities for folks to still be fire resistant. And that's built into the W the YUC, the YUI. It is built in in terms of what is your fire severity based upon all the calculations. But there are some very specific amendments that I would ask that if we are going to adopt this that we we put in there and we amend the w the yui code specific to the town of netherland so that, would, that would be Karen. i mean that would be wonderful especially if the proposals were general enough that they would also apply to future changes where we'd be able to say whatever the changes are we're still protecting these zones or these classes of of homes from uh, being forced to upgrade to this. So, okay, yeah, I just wanted to bring, I just wanted to bring that up and see if that might be useful. Yep. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thank you. Sounds like a really good path forward. And thank you, Jonathan, for, for working on it. I just wanted to ask something. Um, couldn't you just use part of it, like say the siding and the roofing and not the interior beams um, with this wildland interface? Because that seems to be the most likely that it would catch and spread to another house technically we could adopt any single sections i encourage you all to look at look at boulder's adoption of this um, you could also look at uh, boulder county's adoption of this and you're going to find that the county and the city of boulder have a very very different adoption of this code so and I mean, couldn't you only have it apply to new constructions or homes that were built after a certain year it does only apply to new constructions there's generally a percentage in a remodel situation or a strip strip and strip that these codes take in so in the roofing it's called out as 25 percent when you right add on, I, I it's think. like 40 percent addition onto the structure so and yeah it is only going to be required for new buildings so well, i mean at that point you're making a new building you might as well that's my opinion uh, do your part. We're at this point, all the new buildings on first and second street, those little houses, they're just shingles and wooden siding. I think, um, they, they could have been a little bit more in tune to wildland interface in that sense, but. Well, what they're saying okay. is those actually did meet, meet this code. Um, yeah, they did because of the gravel. It, well, it's because of where they are in terms of their, their hazards. What's going to be required of a house on Second Street is going to be far different in this code than what's required of a house up by where you live on Big Springs. Well, I mean, they have just shingle roofs, so it's, there is no requirement for metal roofs in this or anything like that. No, uh, you can meet the requirements, and it's it has to do with the amount of material. So they can be shingle roofs if they meet the fire resistance and the gotcha. asphalt requirement. Like it doesn't they, have to necessarily they, be metal. It just has to be fire or ignition resistant. So asphalt roofs would would fit. But we can so, we can move on. I just I would ask that the rest of the BOT start to look at, you know, in a place like Boulder, you can update a code and it's going to move a lot more functionally. We have to kind of recognize in Ned that this town was built in hodgepodge little times as a mining, then as a recording town, then as a partying town. And we've kind of 
kicked the can down the road with a lot of infrastructure needs in our town, with a lot of transportation needs. And as a government body, we're trying to update all of our building codes and get everything tip and top to the newest thing. But I mean, our, our main sewage line down First Street is still buried by two junk cars from the 1970s. So maybe we should refocus our priorities onto building our infrastructure instead of updating legislation and codes that puts a higher burden on our residents. All right. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you everyone for the, the comments on that. And I, yeah, I look forward to having the, the discussion about, well, the electrical code, as Jonathan said, we have to do that. That's a no brainer, but the, the WUI code and uh, how we want to adopt that is uh, going to be an interesting discussion coming up at a near future meeting. And I believe there's one last topic on this. There is one more. Uh, so we did a little bit of a revitalizing to our construction and demolition program, specifically creating some kind of user-friendly guides, being the brochure, the flow chart, updated the program detail sheet so that it, it better, it flowed better and explained the whole process. We created a dedicated website and we worked with you kind of adopted components of the city of boulder with regards to the sustainable deconstruction plan and the waste servers and tracking form before we didn't have documents like that and it was really on the the builder to come up with providing a waste diversion report so it felt like giving those forms up front gets them thinking about this program and the hope is that we'll see a lot more success in terms of our diversion rates so really just the question before the board is do you support the promotional materials? And do you have any questions? I think this is reading through it. It's a, it's a great improvement over the previous ones and hopefully we'll really smooth the adoption of it and use of it. Um, Jonathan, you wanna kick us off on this one? I like this idea. I guess my real question is how much square footage do you have at the uh, town shop to store any diverted material? That'd be Chris P. He might be able to answer that. Okay, yeah, I'm here. Um, we have quite a bit actually, and um, as it as it grows, you know, I'll take anything with nails and stuff. I can't take painted material because it's not recyclable. But um, generally, I uh, just throw it in a pile, and, and if people we pick from it for our own purposes, you know, staff does, but um, also anybody's really available, welcome to, to pick from it. But um, at some point, we'll go ahead, we'll, we'll put it in the back of the truck, we'll take it down to Boulder, and we'll recycle it. Um, Western, where they mulch it, they chip it up and mulch it and stuff. So we have plenty of room. I've never really got so much that it was overwhelming. And I'd welcome get more materials. Okay. Well, I'll start throwing stuff your guys' way this summertime because I see way too much go into a dumpster. And I think uh, part of it just might not be an awareness on certain builders that town provides this opportunity because um, builders love to save cost on dumpsters. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I'm that's all for great. It, and I'm really stoked to see this happening. And uh, I guess all I'll say is I'll be ha happy to start handing out some of these brochures because I can see you guys getting a lot of really good material that folks in the community could have access to, as well as diverting a lot of waste, particularly when it comes to the steel and uh, concrete, um, cinder block, all of that type of waste. I'm, I'm not sure if builders up here are really aware of the fact that you guys will take recycled concrete and find a way to recycle it for them. And the fact that we're offering incentives is awesome. So I'm all for this. I think this is this is something that shows leadership in building and building sustainably. And I'd much rather see us do something like this than update codes. So much appreciated all the work on this. Thanks, Jonathan. Julian? Yeah, I don't know anything about this. I don't have any experience with the, uh, construction, but I read this and I've learned a lot. So I think it's very readable and uh, hearing Jonathan's praise of it, uh, I'm feeling like I probably wasn't an idiot for thinking it looked okay. All right, Julian, Lindsay. 
Yeah, I think this looks great. Um, anything we can do to divert stuff from going to a landfill is uh, good in my in my opinion. So I support this. All right, Eric. I think this looks really great. I just had a quick question. I hope it's not. I hope it's quick. Uh, which was that I'm just wondering uh, how this program is funded. So they pay uh, contractors pay a C and D deposit at the time in which they pull a building permit. It's just automatically added in, and then town will keep thirty percent, and up to seventy percent can be returned back to the contractor based on their waste diversion. Great, cool. Thank you, Tanya. Oh, I don't have any questions. I think it's a great idea. All right, and Alan. Yeah, I think it looks great. And I'd like to thank Chris for all the work he's done on this. All right. I agree. I think this is this is wonderful. And I think uh, the more we can do to get the word out there to the local contractors and construction to utilize the program, I think it will be could really take off this summer. So I think we are going to see a lot of construction. Um, We'd love to get public comment. I know we've uh, touched on a lot of issues here this evening on the with regards to building codes and down to construction and diversion. Uh, so if anyone from the public would like to weigh in, now be your chance uh, again. Catch our eyes, speak up, raise your hand, and you can have up to three minutes to speak on this issue. Karen Blakemore, I see your hand popped up right away. Yes, this is the first I've heard of the construction and demolition um, program. And just real quick, if you can, for the record, just your name and town resident or not. Uh, Karen Blakemore, I am a town resident. I'm really excited about this program. And um, yeah, I, the, the brochure looks great. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I, uh, I think this is a great thing to revitalize and uh, I hope we get a lot of use of it. So yeah, it looks great. Great. Anyone else? So Mary Daryl had submitted a comment that I was gonna read out loud into the record. Mary okay. Daryl, town resident, updates to building codes. I support in general the update to the code and the work of the committee. Thank you and those of you who offered a clear explanation of every point in the Zoom charrette. As the town continues to review comments, please consider the objectives of the housing subcommittee for Envision 2030, a few of which we discussed at the charrette. As the town fine tunes its future, more creative solutions to our housing dilemma should be attained if the town builds and the potential for some adjustment depending on the overall merit of a given project. Below are some relevant objectives and goals we agreed upon as a subcommittee. Reconsider what constitutes a dwelling unit. Update and adopt local codes that allow for new types of housing and building materials, such as, but not limited to, straw bale, hempcrete, yurts, seasonal use of teepees, etc. Consider and choose some town approved alternatives for low income or traditional housing, transitional housing, such as recreational vehicles, trailers, small scale housing, which may not offer access by vehicle, only by foot, as well as, a con as, well as consider the requirements that requires all housing to connect to water and sewer tap. Please consider adding a clause that creates a route for a project, big or small, to be reviewed by a special committee probably with representatives from groups like SAB and the Planning Commission, which could review special cases in the event of a denial by town of a building. Thank you, Miranda. I, I also have one that was sent to us by Kathleen Gippi and it says, I don't think any code should be adopted unless it has been read by everyone voting. Okay. And, and that's that. Okay. And that was from? From Kathleen. Oh, Kathleen Chipai? Yes. For the record, just get the full name in there. Yeah, okay. 
Anyone else? Again, remember if you are on the phone, star six to unmute yourself. The rise, we will bring this back to the Board of Trustees. Thank you, Miranda. I think you've gotten direction from the board on the four items before us tonight. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. In that case, we will move on to our next discussion item. Uh, which is a funding opportunity for the Revitalizing Main Streets grant, which will be presented to us by Public Works Director Chris Peltier. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first of all, let me just offer some clarity on the, the C&D program before I get into this. I started it in 2017, and I've been collecting materials the whole time, but I just wanted to, and actually I have a big pile of concrete, but I just wanted to say that um, Miranda and Garrett really take deserve the credit for taking this program and brushing the dust off of it and, and revamping it. So I just want to put that out there. They've done a really great job and I've provided minimal input on the whole thing, um, but support it fully. So I just want to do that. Okay, so um, the RMS grant, revitalizing main streets grant, so um, it's in your packet, um, the description of it, um, but I'll give you a brief overview. So um, it's a DDOT grant that supports infrastructure projects that um, addresses safety, um, vulnerable users and pedestrians, um, helps uh, transform urban areas. It's a um, funding um, brought brought forth by Governor Polis through his Build Back Better proposals. Um, it's, a, it's state funds, it's not federal funds, so it's a little bit easier to manage. Uh, there's $22 million available. The max award is $2 million. The funding goals are to reduce fatal crashes, um, provide safe modes of travel for pedestrians and, and vulnerable users. Um, connectivity to appointment centers reduce. Um, the project will help stimulate the economy, um, businesses, employment, and um, and also construction activities. Eligible projects are for um, projects that are on the state highway or off-road systems, such as First Street. Um, as the name implies, Main Street. Us walks, pedestrian, um, lighting, traffic calming, uh, transit amenities, public art up to $5,000, um, innovation and technology, and um, systemic problems related to fresh history. Um, that's usually, that's a tough one for Netherlands, especially on our slower traveled streets such as first street that's um it's really you know 15 miles per hour is pretty fast and fit. the application deadline is may 14th boring happens at the end of june and then projects are awarded in july and two million is the max award a local match is encouraged but it's not required but in your pack, you'll see in the application, there's criteria for scoring. So I highly recommend match um, because some of the uh, scoring criteria is difficult for Netherlands to meet, such as um, AMI, um, average median income, tend to be higher than average in Boulder County, and that's what they use. I recommend at least 10%. Um, projects projects being proposed so so you know the tip project is going on and that's focusing on west first street and it's connectivity connectivity and 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 um pedestrian mobility and, and so forth so that's going on there's a lot of focus going on in, on the west end of town then with the sms grant there's also um rebuilding the sidewalk over at by the library and 
and there's um, some crosswalks that we're going to install. And that's right now just in the IJ phase, so we don't have a design yet. So as we get closer to moving design, that will be coming before you in, in the various ways. Um, but it does take time. You know, these projects take years, and, uh, and so that's why it's important to keep pursuing these these grant opportunities when they come up. It just takes so long to get through them all. So um, what I'm proposing tonight are improvements to East First Street. East First Street hasn't really been um, uh, updated for a long time. And, um, I, and I brought a project actually similar to this, to the DDA a couple years ago. It was called the TAP Project. Um, transportation alternative project, and it was basically a sidewalk project and varying power lines. Uh, but they, at that time, they weren't ready to do the project, and, and the project essentially died. And, and I never actually brought it before the BOT. At the end. however, it does align with their uh, master plan quite well. So. Um, so yeah, the aim in your packet tonight, there are, are three scenarios um, implied in, in that aim. And um, they're all beneficial to Netherlands downtown. And um, the projects address um, ideas that are well-documented and stated goals of the various planning documents that um, Netherlands has sprinkled throughout all their, their documents. Um, and, and I put in your packet a section of the DDA um, master plan from 2017. I think it was updated. And um, this sort of, sort of highlights those uh, focuses for, uh, for that area of town. Um, so the projects align well with those documents. Um, so the first project that uh, I'd like you to consider is um, a side, the constructing the sidewalk on the north side of East First Street, and that would be along the where the covered wagon is, and and the businesses along that stretch, and also burying the power, because um, burying the power is so uh, expensive, and it's complicated, and. Um, and it's great to be able to bury, no pun intended, to bury the cost of that within the project. Uh, because uh, when do you have the opportunity to do something like that? So uh, such a high cost, you don't get much value out of it. But the the poles are really obstruction of our canary and then obviously it's all. And it is um, identified in, in goals of the DDA. So that's the, the first project, right? Figured it cost about a million dollars. Actually, I think I estimated like really shoot from the hit uh, under a million dollars. But um, with those kind of things, there's so many unknowns. And the other thing about constructing a sidewalk is that it must terminate somewhere. So you can't just build a sidewalk and have it end. It won't fund the project. Like that. So the, um, I'm proposing um, extending the sidewalk down to Snyder Street turning the corner and connecting with uh, Second Street. The second project that I would like you to consider is um, reconstructing the sidewalk on the uh, the south side of East First Street. And that would be the co-op and where the deli is and Crosscut and so forth. Um, in addition to that, um, adding a loading zone, because you'll see, and I think everybody's noticed that when um, delivery trucks are on First Street, they take up the whole road, right? And, and it's hard to get by with the cars parking on the left, and then the delivery trucks, and then the dollies going up and down the street. And uh, there's really no room for delivery. So that is also a project identified in the DDA's master plan is um, adding a loading zone. And I see that, I think there's really an opportunity to do that. And I've got some pictures here at the end. So when I'm done talking, I'm going to share a few photos that will help you visualize what I'm talking about. But the um, it's sort of indent in where the deli is and the, the sidewalk kind of jogs next to the co-op. 
I think there's an opportunity there to, right now it's like a, a flower bed and, and honestly, probably not a flower bed. It's probably just, you know, vegetation. Um, but I think there's an opportunity there that you could create a loading zone, widen the sidewalk there, actually back a truck up to an elevated sidewalk where the truck would be able to open its doors, remove the materials directly from the truck onto the sidewalk out of the driven way. Um, and of course, there'd be some engineering and, and design involved in that, but I think it, I think that's really doable. And then there's some other areas around there that um, where the space just isn't utilized efficient. So that's um, the second project I'm proposing. And again, that sidewalk would have to continue in some fashion all the way down to Snyder Street, kind of where that poles in the middle of First Street. It kind of doesn't make sense. That pole would have to move and, and then connect over to second in one way or another. And then the third project or the idea is to do both, um, which in my mind would be truly transformational for the Netherlands um, because it just really needs it. It's a very busy place and it's not very user friendly. So, um, uh, Miranda, could you scroll to the questions, please? I didn't know if you wanted to share. Yes. I do want to share. Okay. Let me share. I'll, hold on, I'm going to share right okay. now. Okay. Uh, first of all, I have some photos. So, I mean, we've all seen first trees. We all know what it looks like, but, um, I wanted to highlight, you know, how in really in disrepair it is, and it's beyond just like maintenance. It's it really needs reconstruction. This is actually really narrow through here, um, and it doesn't accommodate well to have you know two way traffic. I'll just flip through these real quick. You see, there's a pole in the way. It's very difficult to have, um, you know, a decent sidewalk through here. It's not ADA. Clearly not ADA. Here is again, snowy sidewalk in Netherlands. Basically the same picture. This is a good photo because, um, well, you see the, the power lines in, in the background. It'd be great to, to remove those and have pad mounted transformers and really clean up downtown. And I think this is an opportunity, but also what this highlights is that people are walking down the road. This is how you get through um, First Street. You really have to be an able-bodied person in order to do this. And the other thing um, where these cars here uh, on the left, it's actually not parking area. I don't stripe it, it's half dirt. Um, it's just available space for a car to park, but it's not a great parking area. And actually, um, a couple of years ago, we had a visitor fall and they, they broke their teeth um, in some area over there and um, wanted the town to pay for, for you know, their, their damages. And, um, and, and the point of that is, it's just not very user friendly. Now, I thought in, in this area, you could create some kind of loading zone. If it could be right by the, the deli, maybe it would be down the street a little bit where again, could back up to an elevated platform, the sidewalk and deliveries and materials could directly be um, moved over to business. Let me, a couple more pictures. Um, again, it's busy, so it's a busy day here. Right now I have some uh, traffic counters on, on first streaks, I'd really like to understand how much traffic we have, especially in the weekend. Really see the uh, pedestrians intermingling with cars, you know, and it's not safe. <clears throat> yep. Um, 
this just highlights the fact that it's not ADA friendly. And, you know, in Netherlands, and living in the mountains, it's tough, and you have to make a decision, and able-bodied people can, can live here. And, and actually, it's a proven, well-documented that Netherlands population is aging. Um, and the average median age is increasing over time here. So, um, but, uh, you know, so as we all get older, it'd be nice to have it uh, a little bit more user-friendly. Not just that, um, the visitors that come here should have the opportunity to be mobile in Netherlands, and you can't, you can't get up that. Uh, and ironically, you know, we have a um, friendly Netherlands guy there. We actually have a um, ADA parking space. I'm going to flip through because you've already seen this. <clears throat> the end. Again, no sidewalk on the bottom half of town here. And the sidewalk would actually probably belong where that picnic table. But, um, you know, we have you know, an ADA space here, kind of in the middle of nowhere. It's essentially a placeholder so that somebody has to park. But what happens is they have to get out of their car, roll up the street, and access um, the sidewalk. So I uh, just wanted to highlight that. And then right here is what I was talking about earlier. Like, you know, there's that sort of indent in the deli and, and I, I could envision that this um, sidewalk could be widened and, you know, and, and the awning and stuff could be reconstructed, but then a truck could actually back up to that sidewalk if it was done correctly and be able to do their deliveries right in, right onto the, uh, right on the side. And finally, I want to one more thing. Let me just bring one more thing. Because <clears throat> I, I think this is interesting and maybe some, some of you aren't aware of it. But um, so again, the sort of light pink box here is a stone planter. And I think, you know, if it was uh, designed more efficiently, that could be used for the loading. And then I made this red line here to show that the, the sidewalk would have to be quite in. And then, um, you know, and it has kind of the, the funky stuff around here um, that could be changed. But the, the one thing that's kind of interesting is that the, the right of way, it is 57 feet wide here, but so much of it is being encroached on by the businesses on the north side of the road or south side of the road that you can't utilize it. You know, for example, the co-op, the, the register at the co-op is actually in the right of way. And it's neither here nor there. You just got to work around it. But I, I thought I'd, I'd point that out, and that's why Netherlands, that's why Church Street is so difficult to deal with. Um, okay, I'm done. I'm done sharing. Let me get out of. Um, Miranda, could you bring up those questions, please? Because I, I don't have them in front. Bring them up. I have three main questions for you guys um, to consider. Um, one of them was um, to to um, support some one of the projects. You'd rather staff just focus on one of the projects, um, and then um, a nod to which project you'd like us to focus on, the um, or the whole thing. The second. Um, question was, uh, would you request or would you support staff going to the DDA to uh, request a match um, for these projects? And the, the last question was that uh, does the board support staff submitting the application for the proposed project if DDA supports it, it chooses not to provide match? Because you can, um, uh, a match isn't required However, um, it will make the application much stronger. I, I did attend a, um, a meeting today um, talking about the, the, the grant funds, and there are 180 people on this meeting. So I know it's going to be uh, 
really competitive. But you know, looking at those pictures, you can see we knocked safety out of the park here in Netherlands in AD in ADA accessibility and stuff. I can really make a good case for that. These other pieces that are hard for Netherlands to fall into. So um, so those are my three questions for you, and I'd be um, I'm ready to take questions. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for the bringing forward the idea. And as always, thanks for chasing down all these funding opportunities. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's great to see it coming together. I'm, I personally, I'm in great favor of this going for the DDA. I think it aligns really closely with their master plan and uh, be interested to see if they were in support of it. Um, love to hear input from the other rest of the board and we'll begin this time with Alan. Well, Chris, I think you've clearly demonstrated the need and we've all experienced it. And it would be a nightmare for anyone in a, in a wheelchair. So I'm very supportive of it. I guess my question is, what do you anticipate the match would have to be approximately? I, I think we would need at least 10% um, to get a, a fair score. That'll kind of get that half of that 10% score um, that's identified on the application. A full 10% would be, a full 10% score would be a 20% match. That's, that's a hefty ask for um, a $2 million project potentially. Uh, and I'm not sure the DDA would have the appetite for it. Um, I think it's a great return on their, their money, but I would be pretty much spending all their money. <laughs> so yeah, uh, so yeah. the match would be about $200,000? 10% and if we did a 20% match, it would be 400. Okay. Yeah, I'm supportive of uh, continuing to investigate and see what we come up with. Thank you. Eric? Yep, I think this is a great idea. I think that we should uh, bring it to the DDA and ask, ask for a match on this. And I think that we should definitely apply for both projects Right. Julian? Yeah, I have a couple of questions for Chris. Uh, Chris, if if we apply for the full two million, how does that affect the likelihood of approval, the likelihood of getting the grant, uh, as opposed to applying for only one million? Is there is there is there a bias based on how large the request is? Well, they can offer less. Mm -hmm. And often in the application, it'll say something to the effect of, well, if you were awarded less, could you still do the project? So um, okay. by having these sort of different scenarios, we'd line ourselves up to, to take less money and, and, you know, and, and do half do of one the or the other. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Okay. That sounds good. <laughs> do we have any issues with those sidewalks uh, regarding ownership or are those sidewalks town property you start to finish? Um, that's kind of a gray area. You know, <laughs> I, yeah. It, I forgot, it's Netherland. Yeah, yeah, so, um, you know, I don't maintain, um, like the co-op, for example, you know, it's really their building. Um, and so we expect them to maintain right, and, however and, it is. And we have an agreed encroachment with them, right? It would require that. And if yeah. this project went through, then, you know, the town could help take ownership of those and mm -hmm. that for them, you know? So mm -hmm. I think it would be a great partnership businesses in that. So we could apply for the 2 million. And if they say, no, nah, I'm not gonna do 2 million, you're gonna do 1 million, that we just do one of the projects and not the other. And that would be an acceptable approach. Yes. Okay, very fine, thank you. That's all I've got. Thanks, Julian. Jonathan. Apologies, finding the mute button. Um, I'm looking forward to see this come to the DDA. I am curious whether or not they will respond. It is a lot, a lot of money to be asked. That said, there is some needs for adjustments on First Street. Um, beyond the DDA, it might be nice to also reach out to. Um, SAB and ProSAB as well. Um, 
Potentially, maybe the way to deal with pedestrian cars intermingling on First Street may not actually be a sidewalk, is a proposal that I would like thrown in here. That it may be the restoration of a river walk or something that actually creates a little bit more uh, connection with our open spaces and the things we have out here. We seem to be going very heavy on this, let's redo our sidewalks and let's redo our roads. And I'm not against that in any way, and I really appreciate all the effort and the thought you put into this, Chris. And I agree with you. It is a, it is a safety hazard, but we are a small mountain town with a trail system that could use a little bit more love. And maybe we can find a way to start utilizing that trail system to accommodate some of these goals and desires instead of building a bunch of sidewalks in a mountain town that hey when i grew up here we got along fine without sidewalks and you know it almost seemed like you could get around town better before there were the side rocks so i'm just going to throw that out there i'd love to see this in the dda but i'd also like us to start considering some potentially more innovative ways to address our pedestrian vehicular conflicts in town all right lindsay yeah, I'm, I'm definitely in support of this. Um, you know, somebody who spends time shopping downtown and going to the co-op and everything, and sometimes I have walked in the road. Um, so I think having having improvements down there and, and those sidewalks would be a step in the right direction to, to keep people out of the road. Um, and having a loading dock would be great because, yeah, there are times when those trucks are blocking traffic and making it even more difficult to get through town. Um, and burying the power lines, I think, would make our town a little more aesthetically pleasing and being able to stand in downtown and look up at our mountains um, and our beautiful sky and, and not have our view impeded by kind of ugly, ugly power lines. So I am, I am all for going for this and bringing it before the DDA and hopefully they will provide some matching funds. All right, Tanya. Uh, hi, um, I love the idea of a river walk. That that's hopefully going to be happening with the maybe with that side of that trail project. But um, I had a few questions. You you kept showing that sidewalk by the covered wagon and the mine shaft. I remember when they made that. Um, and it's probably one of our nicest sidewalks. Any idea why they didn't make it a ramp instead of stairs? Oh no. No. Um, it I'm seems to out when it's a, one of our nicer sidewalks. So then, um, my other worry is um, losing parking because with the the tip project, you said you were losing a few parking spaces over there in the parking lot for the sidewalk. And I'm, I would you've envisioned that we're going to be losing parking. I think that potential exists. Yeah, I don't know if we can afford that personally. My other concern is, um, the tip projects going to start soon and then they could potentially be overlapping. Yeah, they could. And actually yeah, so that could be beneficial. And in fact, I reached out to, um, some CDOT contacts to see if I could use some of the SMS grant as a uh, potentially a match to this, which would be really great. Um, and what do you mean? Like it would offer a nice connectivity and continuity of those projects because, you know, we're, we want to improve the crosswalk at, at the highway there. And then obviously this, the sidewalk on the, the west side of first Street. Be great to continue that effort to the east side and and have a nice east to west direction flow for that, that's huge. Yeah, I just think like logistically, for that year it would be pretty um, difficult for people who live in town to navigate town. Um, but my other um, question was, uh, it was is there any chance that this grant could be applied for something more like uh, the second bridge that we've been wanting for so long? And you know, instead, I don't think so. 
it doesn't really fit well with the criteria. I mean, you can look at it for yourself, Tanya. Yeah, I did. I, you said something about a mile or so, and so it did be. I, yeah, I just I feel like I'm worried that that's never going to happen. Um, and then um, on your proposal, it's not clear, and I'm just for your benefit when you send it in, how this is going to help with the limited parking, the poorly maintained buildings, and the lack of commercial and retail space, as you've listed as like concern. When there was like five concerns. I can see how it helps with uh, uh, the inadequate loading and the poor walkability, but it says issues to be addressed, and I, I don't see how that's applicable for this. So I don't know if, if you know, when you're when you're sending it in, I, I think it, it's a little misleading. I don't know why that's in there and why in the drawings, which I love those drawings. I don't know who did them, but they're great. Why it shows all that infill going on. Like, what does that have to do with the sidewalk? That's just kind that's of all, threw me off. Yeah. yeah, that's all documentation from the, the DDA master plan. So that's actually not for part of this proposal. That's showing the, the place it came from. Oh, it's just to me, it's a little misleading. Um, because like, oh, wow, that, that looks awesome. You know, but then it's like, it's not <laughs> that. Um, That's so the overarching goal of it's the a grant, So, I mean, of course you should go for it, I suppose, but I'll just say like, I'm personally not as enthusiastic about it as everybody else, but I mean, sure, go for it. Go see what you can get. I like the idea of bearing the power lines more than anything else. That seems to me the best thing you could do, but that's my opinion. Free yeah. I agree with Tanya. I think it's pretty exciting that, you know, it's not often that we find a grant opportunity that in which we can do utility berry as part of it. I think that makes us a pretty particularly exciting opportunity and uh, what we can, you know, making sidewalks and a loading dock, if that's what we do to be able to bury those lines as well, I think that's that's significant. And I, I really look forward to hearing what the DDA says about it when you take it before them. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I, want, I do also oh, want to take I have one more ask of the, the BOT after since we've already talked is um, another piece of the uh, application is is public support. So, um, you know, a formal letter of support from um, the BOT or from the mayor would be great. Um, or if you could reach out to businesses. And I'll do the same. I'll make the same ask to the DDA. It's probably really more their wheelhouse, but mm -hmm. uh, I just want to put that out there. Okay. Yeah. And I also want to do want to take public comment on this, but uh, knowing that we still have a couple agenda items ahead of us tonight, I will just right now ask: Do we have a motion to extend the meeting to ten thirty? So moved. <laughs> yeah. And I second. This is Trustee Taylor. Okay, Miranda. We have a motion and a second for extension. Trustee Kim Desmile? Yes. Trustee Taylor? Yes. Trustee Apt? Yes. Trustee Danforth? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Baumhofer? Yes. Trustee Corbelin? Yeah. Mayor Larson? Yes. All right. Uh, before we move on, we will take uh, public comment on this idea of a uh, revitalizing Main Street grant application. If anyone from the public would like to speak on this for up to three minutes, now would be your opportunity. I would like to. Ah, please identify yourself and you have three Ron minutes. Mitchell. Ron Mitchell, town resident. Uh, I think it's great and uh, as an idea. Uh, and my proposals of about three years ago, I put in it the idea of Pulling the buildings back from the north side 25 feet. So not only could you have maybe a six foot sidewalk instead of a five or a four, you could have a pedestrian amenities and uh, picnic tables all along the street and that sort of thing. And I still want to do that. I still feel that's a, an objective that would help given the fact that all of those buildings on the south side are sitting in the middle of the street, the full 57 feet of right of way isn't really usable, even though you're negotiating for those buildings. They probably will be redeveloped at some, some point, but most likely a long time after the north side is redeveloped. So 
I would be in favor of undergrounding uh, the utilities because that would take place in the right way and maybe uh, revitalizing the water system and getting rid of the junk cars so you'd have access to the sewer line. And uh, the uh, I like the idea of the uh, uh, loading zone where Chris has proposed it. So I would hope that you would consider doing the south side rather than uh, uh, the north side. I want to answer a question uh, that someone asked is why the stairs are there rather than a ramp. About 20 years ago when the stairs were put there, uh, Ray Rovey, a blind man in town, uh, had a very difficult time getting up and down uh, First Street. And so I talked with him and asked him what his preference would be. And he said the stairs because he would be able to know where they were and they would be safer than a ramp that he could slip and slide on. And uh, so I did what Ray Rovey wanted and put the stairs there at that time. Obviously, both are what you really need. So that's a short version of my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Anyone else? Karen Blakemore, is your hand up from for this or before? Uh, for, for this one. Karen okay, great. Blakemore, town resident. I support this project from a safety perspective, an aesthetics perspective, and also uh, to ease traffic congestion. Thank you, Karen. Anyone else? Kathleen, I see your hand. Unmute yourself. She says, I've, I've got it. She says, Kathleen Chip, I, I support putting utilities underground. And let me just pull it up. And that's the comment. Okay, thank you very much. Anyone else? Not seeing or hearing any comment. Bring it back to the board. Uh, yeah, Chris, look forward to hearing uh, what you hear from the DDA and then bring it back to us and we can discuss, uh, you know, what scale of project makes sense. Thanks. Thank you. All right, we have one final discussion item this evening. And this is uh, the news, which I think we have all heard at this point. Um, I. I can't say enough for the work that Karen Garrity has done for this town over the last four years. Uh, when our last town administrator left in 2017, uh, actually right about this time of year, and we started the process of searching for someone new, I could not have imagined we would have found somebody who, who fit in so well to Netherland, who built such great relationships within the town staff, town boards, and the public, and has really done such an incredible job. And I. Just want to take this chance to publicly thank her and I, this I'm going to be doing this a lot over the next 5 months, but publicly thank Karen for all she has done for this town, particularly in the last year as we've been dealing with COVID and has she's seen this town through in, a, in such a strong position. And I am so excited for what comes next for you, Karen, and the, the exciting future you have. So um, thank you so much. I know this leaves us now to discuss how we're going to transition, but. I just want to take this first public opportunity to thank you uh, copiously and uh, for the first of many times for all you've done for Netherland. Thank you so much, Mayor, Mayor Larson. I really appreciate what you're saying. Um, I did want to mention that I thought you might be dealing with the other item that you postponed before we are, we do this. Are you, we're going to do this first? Well, it's an action item, so I was going to okay. get the, yeah. Uh, got it, got it, okay. All right, thank you. Well, thank you anyways. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I'm really hoping um, you know, you know, that the five month period will make it a smooth transition. We already have a team in place for operational transitions. Um, Miranda, Rita and I and um, already are putting a timeline together and uh, the plan and working with the department heads. And I feel so good about um, 
the the staff and the financial position of the town and just so many other things that um, you know it's a tough it's a tough decision to make and at the same time uh, I'm really looking forward to sort of reimagining myself and how I show up to serve. So I just am thankful to everyone in the community who's been such a great partner to me and I'm so glad I have five more months. I want to open this up to the board of trustees. Um, obviously, the question before us is like, how do we want to deal with the transition? And I think we have uh, obvious plans and in, in um, or obvious steps to take to begin a search for a new town administrator. And I would propose that we start looking at how we are at our next meeting. We would actually have a or next meeting. One of the next two meetings. Wow, it's already 10 o'clock. I'm definitely fading fast here, guys. Um, we would have a proposed uh, job announcement, and so we can start looking at getting uh, applicants for the position so that we can have a somebody in place to or ready to take uh, take the place midsummer so that there'd be some overlap in time for uh, training and questions to be answered prior to uh, prior to September. So I, I will uh, open this floor up now to the trustees, beginning with Mayor Pro Tem Jonathan Baumhover. You know, I can't echo more than what you have said, Chris, about how much it has been a pleasure to work with Karen. Um, I came onto the BOT shortly after Karen was hired as our town administrator, and I have nothing but good things to say about Karen's work here. I would personally, I'm in full agreement with what the town and our staff has recommended. I would love to see the opportunity to just move our current town clerk, Miranda, into this position. And I feel that the transition team, as well as the time period that they have provided, provides a great plenty of time for us to kind of go through this transition smoothly. So I would just say I'm sad to see Karen moving on, but I also totally understand and appreciate her taking the time for herself and uh, just uh, want to echo what you said, Chris, and thank you for your time for this community and all the effort that you really have put in. You've gone above and beyond so many, so many times. So thank you. And I have no objections. I think this timeline sounds good. And my belief is that we keep this in house and uh, work to transition our current town clerk into our acting town administrator. Good, Jonathan. Trustee Apt. Yeah, I think we've been very fortunate to have Karen as our administrator, and I very much appreciate everything she's done, and I would absolutely heartily endorse everything that's that's been said. She's done, you know, Karen, you've done a superb job, and it's been a pleasure to work with you. And I also agree with uh, Jonathan. I think Miranda's done an outstanding job and would be a very strong candidate. I don't know what legally uh, has to be done in terms of posting the position and so forth. But I agree with uh, Chris in terms of the timing on uh, getting things done. So I think we've been very fortunate uh, to be working with Karen. So thank you. Eric Coombs is mail. Yes, of course, Karen, thank you so much for everything that you've done for me personally and for the town as well. And for all the, you know, various uh, nonprofits and other work that you do, uh, volunteering and participating, it's uh, been a pleasure. But I do think um, that while if the timeline looks good, um, while we have you know, potentially strong candidates uh, that might come from within town staff already, I do think we should do a serious and rigorous search. I truly believe that doing those kinds of searches um, can only improve uh, the uh, candidate that you know when there are unknown candidates who come in and and show what what maybe is possible and that we should be uh, looking for absolutely the best uh, administrator for the town that we can find and we should be doing a, a, a genuine and rigorous search. Thank you, Eric. 
And I believe, you know, because uh, this is a public uh, public position, we we definitely need to do a, a rigorous search um, open to all applicants. And yeah, definitely think that um, trustee Taylor. Yeah, uh, Karen, thank you very much. I too have greatly appreciated uh, your support in in everything that I've been doing. Um, I, I certainly agree that we need to do a full search, but I will note that if Miranda were so inclined to put her hat in the ring, uh, I think that she would have a favorable possibility of getting the job if she's interested. So yes, I'm all for it. And um, looking forward to seeing the various candidates who come forward. Lindsay. Yeah, I when I came to Netherland, actually, when I first moved to Netherland is, I believe, when Karen was being hired. And then shortly after that, I was working on the planning commission and got to interact with her. And it's just been a wonderful experience working with Karen. Um, she always goes above and beyond is always quick to respond and answer questions and always does so in, in a clear and concise manner that, that makes even really difficult topics easy to understand. And so I think for my, you know, experience being in our town government, it couldn't have been better, you know, than working with Karen. So thank you so much. Um, and in terms of the timeline, you know, I think in our next meeting, we should absolutely review a job description and job posting. Um, and get that out there as soon as we can. Um, I think that timeline sounds good that we can have enough time to review candidates, review all the applications, have interviews, and then have enough time to hire somebody plus do um, training while we still have Karen around. So um, I'm in favor for, for that whole process. Thank you. And Trustee Corbelin. Well, I agree with everybody's opinion. Um, I want to also say the same. Karen's always been really helpful whenever I have a question and answers promptly and has been a great, um, oh, what's, I'm trying to get the word, but helping me acclimate to this. She's been good at helping me with that. So um, we'll miss her. And I agree. I think, you know, obviously Miranda knows what she's doing. Um, but of course, we have to put it out to the public and see who who wants to apply for the job as well. Um, so I agree with everybody. Thank you, Tanya. And I will also open this up for uh, public comment on uh, the leadership transition we are looking at in the next five months here in Netherland. Anyone from the public would like to uh, speak on this? Now would be your opportunity. I'd like to thank Karen also. It's been a pleasure to work with her and the staff. Uh, I've never had the opportunity to work with anybody quite as talented as she is. And I'm very sorry that she's leaving and I want to thank her personally for her service to the town. Thank you, Ron. Anyone else? Again, I think we're going to have many opportunities to thank Karen over the next five months and um, really encouraged by the fact that we are, it looks like, you know, by September, we will be able to throw a, a very fun and large going away. Thank you party for you, Karen. Uh, I, I want just, a dance kind of party. I, I, a dance I, party. I'm, I'm just going to put that out there now. I would like a dance party. So. All right. We'll see how the we'll see what the public health orders are like, and That's I do right. just I do just want to thank everyone um, for all your kind kind words. It means a lot to me, Ron and and everybody. Um, just thank you so much. Thank you. Um, that note would be great to be ending the meeting, but we are going to swing back to our one action item this evening, which is regarding uh, resolution 2021-06. Um, Tanya, you asked for this to be pulled from the consent agenda. Would you like to open discussion on it? Uh, sorry, 
Um, yeah, we were just asking, I was asking questions about uh, the minutes that to me wasn't a hundred percent clear the translation from what the minutes said to what the Mountaineer said, and then again onto what the current um, state of 645 is. So I didn't, I just don't see that connection because obviously the minutes don't show everything. And I think we were asking um, Jennifer Madsen where some of the information was it was yep. given to the Mountaineer. Yeah, you're right. You reminded me that we had asked the town attorney to research things. Uh, it seems like ages ago that we were talking about that. So actually, let me turn this over to Jennifer, since you are the one who has uh, been digging into this over the last couple hours. Yes, thank you. So let me just start off by saying um, a couple things that we know and a and some things that we don't know. So what we know is that ordinance 645 that's in the books um, for Netherlands, that it was authenticated by the mayor um, at the time, by the town clerk, that that does not match. Um, it doesn't align with the minutes and um, it doesn't match what was published in January of 2008. So that's really why we're here tonight is because the ordinance 645 in the books doesn't um, line up with the publication and it doesn't line up with the minutes. Um, the corrected ordinance that's before you does match um, with the publication with the exception of all of the strikeout language. So um, those are the things that we don't, we do know. Um, we don't have all of the information. So what we don't have is we don't have the agenda packet that was given to the Board of Trustees at that January 2008 meeting. So I don't really know what ordinance um, draft ordinance the Board of Trustees had at that January 8th, 2008 meeting. I assumed that it was the ordinance 645 that's in the books, but it looks like it probably wasn't. Um, but again, I don't know. Uh, Miranda has looked for the agenda packet for that meeting and is not finding it in the town records. There are some additional sections that are in the corrected ordinance 645 that are not in the ordinance 645 that's in the books and that are not mentioned in the minutes. Um, so I, I can assume, I don't know, but I could assume that maybe there was a different ordinance that was presented to the Board of Trustees. Um, I don't know how we would find that out because we don't we don't have the agenda packet um, there. So, and I believe there's four sections that are additional sections that are in the corrected um, ordinance 645. Now I will say that those sections are in the Mountaineer publication. So those sections have were at, in January of 2008, those sections were, um, presented to the public as new code or changes to the code. Um, and then the other issue that I wanted to address is that um, Trustee Coombs Ismail asked me about the meeting minutes where there was a discussion of amendment for um, where it talks about striking out language. So let me go to the discussion that where it says an amendment for to eliminate the requirement. No amendment is necessary. This is the action um, related to 16.202. And so under the amendment for discussion, the action um, 
for making this change is to have the parking requirements apply in the C CBD move to strike the third and fourth sentences. And then to require payment in the parking fund, add the following sentence. In the CBD, applicants shall meet their off street parking requirement. And let me maybe what would be easiest. Um, so if you go to, if you were to look at the ordinance 645 that's in the book, the last two sentences of 16202 are taken off. So there's no real strikeouts, but those are removed. And then that other language is put in place. So you don't see strikeouts in the corrected ordinance because they're not, you're not changing text that already existed in the code. You're amending the draft ordinance that was presented to the Board of Trustees, if that makes sense. Got it. Yeah, I think that's a fairly well. I don't think it is really a satisfying <laughs> answer, but I think it's satisfying enough in this context. Um, it, I just wanted to make what I'm just trying to make sure is that we don't make another mistake that some board 20 years later is looking like, what the heck did they do with this, you know, with this ordinance 645 in 2021? Um, and to, to that effect, I mean, I don't know if anyone else has questions about those missing those like vanishing sentences that uh, seem to just not exist in any documentation anywhere. So we couldn't possibly strike them out because they're not there. Um, but the other question I had was um, about the fifth amendment in the minutes. And I just didn't bring this up because we were already moving to, to, uh, to make this item an action item um, before, but I, I'm just, I just want to clarify because there's nothing in the minutes that actually says explicitly that that fifth amendment uh, was not like that, that the, the text that they are referring to, the language they're referring to, there's nothing in the minutes that suggests it was not actually deleted, right? So it says to delete the section, no amendment to the ordinance is necessary to keep the section, move to delete section 27 of the ordinance. And the only thing that I found was that uh, maybe I'm just not seeing it, but the thing that I found was um, on the next page, it says trustee Porter made a motion and mayor pro tem Cornell seconded to change second part of section 31 of the ordinance changes owner to applicant. And then the role called vote uh, was called there and passed unanimously, which suggests that they were intending on retaining the language if they were going to change one aspect of it and not strike it out uh, as it apparently had been presented to them initially. So I I'm reading that as what we have in the in the revised ordinance is as close to correct as we can get. I think that you've done a good job on that and I think it actually is accurate. I just wanted to clarify that this is where we are kind of gleaning the intention of this board uh, to keep that language, which is 16211, I believe, in the Netherlands code. Is that correct? Yes, yes, that's correct. And really, I think, I mean, this is, this is far from perfect. I will admit that um, it is, you know, what we happened on by real, it, this was, there was no intent to find this, um, this problem that we had from 2008 and really we just happened on it. We have a lot of missing information and I don't know if a lot is correct, but we do have missing information. We have minutes that are not great. We have motions in the minutes that are not, you know, they're not um, explicit. Clear, clear motions. Um, and, but we're working with what we have and what the ordinance in front of you tonight, that's the corrected ordinance, it does match 
what is in the public notice. And as Julian keeps reminding us, this is a chance for us to kind of baseline things. This is an opportunity to say, okay, we've, we've recognized the things that have happened 13 years ago. This is where our best intentions, our best thoughts are and hopes are for where we think it stands. And now this becomes the baseline for future discussions regarding parking. Yeah, that's my understanding as well. We're not trying to change anything, right? We're just trying to make sure it matches what we legally had published and what, you know, that sets legal precedence. We're just saying, yep, we found kind of a trail that'll match that. Great. Let's let's just make it all match and then we can review and change and do whatever later. This this is just about being legal and, and consistent. Well, and it's cleaning up the town books. And so yeah. that when somebody goes back to ordinance 645, which they may never do, but um you know, we there's a record that at least engaged in this discussion and made um, made an effort to align it with what was published and what was in the minutes. Brett right, Kinsella, right? Oh, yeah. Further comments, thoughts, questions from board members on this? We also have um, proposed uh, motions, both to approve or deny, should anyone want to make one of those? I just wanted to note that the, the key reason for this is that if we do not approve this and we decide to change the parking regulations, which one are we changing? I see that as the only primary function for this aim. We must know what ordinance we're changing when we move to change parking ordinances. And this just says, yes, we've all decided there's only one. Now we can change it if we want to, because we know exactly what it is we're changing. And that's it. Yes, that's I, I believe that's all we're trying to accomplish here because multitasking gets harder and harder as I get older. And that means yeah, let's <laughs> get basic first and then we can take on tasks of yeah. the task of changing. And be be just reminded myself before anyone makes a motion, I, this is an action item, so we will take public comment. I guess uh, I guess the only comment I have here is I'm I'm glad that we opened this discussion up and while it might have been a use of time I think the discussion that has been had regarding this update to 645 and everything that has happened it needed to be on public record in this form as a discussion so I guess my only comment here is I am glad this got pulled from the consent and then I'm glad that it got this 20 minutes of discussion. I am fully in agreement with Julian that we are resetting a baseline so that we have something to work from because without doing this, we have nothing. And I really appreciate the work that has been done by Jennifer, Karen and Miranda and town staff to try to find a way that we can make this work and provide us a baseline to move forward. But my only comment was I'm glad this is officially an action item and separate from the consent. And I think in the future, even with things like this that we're trying to fix, we need to provide the opportunity for a longer discussion on public record to have all of these answer questions answered for folks to review. So thank you. And with that, I would motion to approve resolution resolution 2021-06. Well, can I'll can I to make it to the whole? Oh, I wanted to get a public comment on this because it is an action item. Oh, oh my bad. <laughs> Just withdraw that uh, motion there for a moment. Uh, we will open up the floor for public comment. Anyone who would like to speak on this matter, uh, please raise your hand, jump on video, uh, or begin speaking. I see a flashing hand from Ms. Chippy. I'm Ron Mitchell here. Okay, uh, Ron, you have the floor. Just remember name, name and uh, town resident or not. Ronald Mitchell, town resident. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that my application for what I thought was uh, outdoor sales turned into a parking issue. And uh, I'm glad that uh, you're coming to a resolution. Thank you. 
And Thank I, you, it's Miranda, I have Kathleen's comment. Uh, Kathleen Chabai, 30 year East Magnolia resident and 17 year business owner. I've spent too much time reviewing all this with ordinance 645 to have the attorney spew more confusing and incorrect nonsense into it or the BOT passed this today. I have figured it out way more than the attorney has. And if this could be postponed to the next meeting, I could have time to educate everyone why this should not be passed today and or as is at a later date. There are numerous problems that have not been brought up besides the CBD exemption confusion. And the language today does contain more sections that were not in 645 in 2008 and that were not discussed or added per the minutes at the January 8th, 2008 meeting. This simply needs to be postponed until the next meeting and that should not be a problem since the language has been wrong at Town Hall for 13 years. And no matter what, since it, what is on Muni code stands in the court of law. This is more like housekeeping at this point, unless it is passed today, as then the BOT would be changing the code. I can point out, I can point that out between today and the next meeting. There is so much that needs reviewed and resolved. Doing this today is hasty and not in the best interest if we really want to correct things. Hearing a trustee say we should pass this first and fix it later is insane nonsense since 13 years have gone without it, with it sitting there wrong. We the people need the BOT to motion to postpone and I'm more than happy to work with whoever wants to figure this out more so than what is in front of everyone today. If it does pass today, I am filing a code complaint immediately because from what my research shows of all the available public record, they are not passing what is passed on January 8, 2008, or what was sent to the newspaper. I want to point out that both Larson and Cornell adopted, voted to adopt the inadequate January 8, 2008 minutes from January 8, 2008 that are adding to the problem currently at hand. In my opinion, this should have been corrected at the January 22, 2008 meeting. Every motion Cornell made on January 8, 2008 was to sections that are different from the language being reviewed and presented in the minutes on January 8, 2008. And the minutes amendments do not reflect any changes to section numbers or additions in the numbers of sections. The ordinance, ordinance 645, town hall, now invalid, has 31 sections and the current proposal has 36 sections. The minutes do not reflect the additions of any additional sections or discussion on changes and what is on record signed and stamped at town hall and what was sent to muni code. One example, the January 8, 2008 minutes, Cornell motioned amendment four, changing section 28 of the ordinance to adding the language, allowing payments into the fund or providing parking behind or under the building in the CBD. According to the January 8 minutes, payment to the, com to the commercial parking fund was section 27, 16, 211, not 28. Section 28 in the January 8th minutes is section 16, 231 organization. And Miranda, does there, is there a tie up? That's three minutes. Um, there's a bit more. And so there, so that, that's three minutes. I would say the board of trustees received this full comment and it'll can be added it to the record. Yeah. And it'll be added to the minutes, the, the physical minutes. Okay. Thank you for your opinion, Kathleen. Anyone else? Bring this back to the board for any further decision. But first, uh, looking at the clock, do we have a motion to extend the meeting? Trustee Taylor, Taylor. I reluctantly move to extend the meeting to ten to, to eleven o'clock. Second. Thank you, gentlemen. Miranda. Mayor Larson. Yes. Trustee Coombs Ismail. Yes. Trustee Danforth. Yes. Trustee Taylor. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Baumhofer. Yes. Trustee yes. Corvalin. Yeah. Trustee yes. Apt. Yes. Thank you. The meeting is extended. Uh, I'll bring this back to the board for any further comments, thoughts, or motions. Well, I would be partial to to postponing this. Make a motion to postpone for next meeting. Are you making a motion? Did you just I make am. a motion? Okay. We have a motion to postpone. The do we have, have a, a second? About the ram no, I have a question about the ramifications of 
well, not taking action on this of postponing um, it isn't. We have to we have to deal with the motion first. We have a, an active motion so that we can have a question okay. and comments after after it is seconded. If it is, do we have a second okay. to the motion on the table? I'll second to table it to the next meeting. We have uh, a second motion and on the ramifications. Okay, we have that. So, Lindsay, what was your question? It, I'm worried that the the ramifications of postponing and continuing to talk about this as if it's an an active thing we're reviewing means that we can't go forward with existing projects since we don't know how to how to apply the parking code to existing projects, and so. Would it force a moratorium if we started to postpone things? We have uh, active applications that are coming before the board at the next meeting. Is that right, Miranda? Yes, that's accurate. So I, I got a question for the whole board right now. We could take a nod of four on this. How many on this board actually like this ordinance and think that it's an effective ordinance? For 13 years, it stood, and we have one deposit into this commercial parking fund and probably about 10, 10 SRUs that had complications as a result of this ordinance. So nod of four, one question, are, do we like this ordinance as a board? I'll say no. But I don't think that's the question before us tonight. Well, I, mean, I, I, I get that, but be addressed because it doesn't really matter if we have a baseline to work from if we're going to change this ordinance. And if we're going to change this ordinance, it leaves it to the applicant's own free will, whether or not how they react to the situation. But basically what's change... happened, uh, I, I agree, but I'm saying basically what's happened is we've come to the awareness that we've been enforcing an ordinance for 13 years that was incorrectly codified into code and while we think we have the understanding we can't prove it now that's great but in the 13 years we've had this ordinance we've also walked through it and there seems from the discussion that we've had to be an appetite on this board to do away with this ordinance so why would we fix this ordinance to push it through with the current applications if our intent as a board is to change it why not just change it because that changing it is a six month process. We haven't had discussions on how we even want to think about changing it. So this is, as we keep saying, is a chance to baseline something and without holding up current applications. Because that was what the point of the moratorium was two weeks ago, three weeks ago, whenever it was, was the idea that if we want to change this significantly enough, then we need to put a moratorium on the proposals before the town. And this board okay. chose not to do that. I understand at that time, the option was to adopt the ordinance as it was written in the paper, not codified under the Mountaineer, which would have drastically changed things. So I guess I get into this conundrum because it seems like we're going to codify and fix an ordinance that we don't agree with, that we don't think it's in the best interest of the town, simply because we need to fix a mistake that happened 13 years ago to push through applications under a current code that none of us agree with simply because those applications are happening. So with that said, I will remove my second and make a motion that we just pass resolution 2021-06 and that we put this on the agenda to fix. So that's my motion to- you're, Okay, you're withdrawing, withdrawing your second. Okay, so we'll open up first. Does anyone have a, does anyone wish to second the motion to post to postpone this until a future meeting that Tanya made? Hearing none, we will open the floor to any additional motions, Jonathan. Just motion to approve resolution 2021-06. Let's get a baseline and uh, I really don't like this ordinance. I think we should fix it. And I think it should be very public that we're talking about it for any potential applicant. I don't like it either and I'll second. Okay, we uh, heard a second there from Trustee Coombs Ismail. I think that was your voice on the overlapping. So we'll give it to, there, give it to you. Miranda, we have a motion and a second on the floor to approve resolution 2021-06. Mayor Larson. 
Yes. yes. Trustee Danforth? Yes. Trustee Apt? Yes. Trustee Coombs Ismail? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Baumhover? Yes. yes. Trustee Corbelin? No. Trustee Taylor? Yes. Motion passes. And yeah, we will definitely be, now we can start addressing the uh, changes we might wanna look at and whether or not this does address the current needs of the town of Netherland and what that might look like. Other business. I, no. one... I would propose this other business and agenda item to strike the amendment that we just fixed in this code. Cause prior to this night in 2008, CBD was always exempt from parking requirements. We had five ordinances in the town code up to this night that exempted it. This is the one night that we have now had to spend two weeks of meetings on discussing, trying to fix a code that changed things drastically. The rest of our ordinances always exempted the CBD. So my other business is I want a second to put this on the next agenda item to amend exactly what we just fixed, remove it and revert back to the code before the night of 2008, when, what, January 28, 2008. I second that. Well, this, yeah, so we have two trustees who want it. We don't have to do a vote on that. We have two trustees who are interested in bringing that forward at uh, the next meeting. I'll write a name up. Thank you. Yeah, I, okay. I look forward to seeing it. Yeah. All right. Anyone else have other business? The one thing I wanted to highlight and let everyone know about is uh, with conversations with Congressman Nagoose uh, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, there's some stuff happening with the budget that basically that he is going to be able to propose 10 infrastructure projects for the second congressional district that will be could be included in the coming federal budget. These are, you know, these go back to what used to be called earmarks or straight up pork. Uh, an opportunity for every congressman to bring money back to their district for projects. Uh, there is great talk within CD2 about what those things he's going to do are. One of the things that's almost certainly going to be included is the uh, funding for RTD to extend the train line north to Boulder and Longmont that they promised, you know, 20 some years ago. Uh, that's going to be one of them. So, we're, you know, some of these projects are big financial projects, but we've also been talking to him about the possibility of using this as funding for Big Springs egress. So this is finally an opportunity where we might have a, a funding opportunity that is just straight up no match. Here's your money to do an infrastructure project uh, with his interest in wildfire pro uh, projects and the wildfire issues. That's uh, something I've been working with him with and would just would. <clears throat> excuse me. I wanted to give everyone a heads up because it is a short turnaround and see if there is uh, interest in the board in continuing to pursue that work with Congressman Nagoose. Uh, why not a second bridge through town? Uh, because we just haven't done any, we don't have a, a map to show, we don't have a, a project. You know, we, the other ones have things that have ha been worked on for years that have integrates with the county, with the state, with the federal forest service, with the town of Nederland. Um, the the hope would be that, the, or the, not the hope, maybe this is just sort of what I'm hearing is this is going to become sort of an annual thing so that we can now start working and looking towards next year and having other projects ready to propose to the congressman. This is very much a last minute change that came out of DC. So we're kind of left scrambling. Well, but you know that there still hasn't been the environmental studies done for the spring crossing and all that. What exactly are you handing him? Uh, the proposal that uh, the, the has been signed off on or has been worked on, excuse me, I'm getting very late, very tired and late and my tongue is not working anymore. Um, the proposal as it stands for the Doe Trail egress with the understanding that those things like the environmental impact, because it's a federal project, would have to then occur. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I mean, you're talking about the original Doe Trail egress? With no, the, 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 the modified one. Yeah. Okay. Did he say anything about renewable energy? Oh, he is well, he's saying a lot about a lot of things about it, but uh, I haven't heard anything about one of these projects being used for renewable energy, but I've only been on a couple of the conversations. I've only heard of one or two projects from the district so far. 
I did actually attend a meeting, um, uh, I think it was last week, uh, for uh, town managers and mayors who do want to apply for the this funding. And really the focus, um, Trustee Apt, is for things, you know, more related to transportation for this one pocket of money. Um, there is going to be opportunity for more infrastructure support, looking at potentially utilities and what you're talking about for renewables. But right now, first of all, we have to turn this around. It's due April 16th. And um, we do have a lot of information that we could include if we do with, go with the Big Springs Egress because we've been working on it so intensely and we have you know, construct, uh, design and uh, build drawings and so forth and approval by the county and by the United States Forest Service. So, but but for what you're talking about, like like the mayor said, there's gonna be opportunities hopefully every year and different focuses every year, um, but, but it does seem like a good opportunity to jump on this if it's something that you all believe is a priority. Okay, thank you. So just uh, go well, down. the environmental implications of crossing the spring need to be addressed in your proposal to him. Proposal. Mm -hmm. Highlight that. I that Boulder County hasn't signed off on that. That's actually not true. Right, not on the spring crossing part. Well, what they asked is that we took the original Doe Trail route and then we looked for options to pull it out of the wetlands and that's what the modified route does so we don't no, it does not it, well I, it, it it actually pulls it up and over the ridge are you talking about the same route that yeah i'm it goes straight through the like a uh, it it absolutely it's going to have to be a bridge over it or something, you can't just put a road in there. I mean, and if he's gonna pay for it, great, but it's 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 not just, it's a gotta be a bridge, that area is a marsh. So well, if we're we... talking about access to the to the Doe Trail Ridge and how to get access to that ridge, there are private property owners that if we could make a deal with them, we could get to that ridge some other way. So I don't think the project necessarily has to be, you know, baked in stone when it's uh, presented to Jonah Goose, but it's going to cost a similar amount of money either way. So we might as well propose well, the Doe Trail Ridge egress. That, that, that's what we were thinking, that we could make it clear that, you know, um, there might be some changes to it. The other thing is he said in this meeting that he is hoping that people come with, you know, we would be in a smaller pot called the community um, projects. And that's a hundred thousand to five hundred thousand. He did say it could go as high as six hundred thousand. So um, you know, it comes close to covering the seven hundred thousand, seven seventy that uh, you know we've had estimates, but those are just rough. But I do want to be clear about that too. But I do think it's a great opportunity, and we should just throw our hats hat, hat in the ring and, and see what what happens. It's your call, though, of course. So, Eric, it sounds like you're in favor of proposing. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Alan? Yeah, I guess I'm focused on renewable energy, so I'm not as enthusiastic. Julian? That, yeah, that seems an entirely reasonable thing to do. Okay. Jonathan? I'd go for it. Okay, Lindsay? Yep, I support it. And Tanya, if we are, would you be in favor of proposing for this if we make it explicit in our application that we will be uh, av avoiding an engineering around the wetlands crossing? Uh, I'm not really too much in support of it as it stands right now. If it we're talking about a, the Wildwood or an alternate route, but I, I I mean, every, you see, you have your majority, so it doesn't really matter. Okay. Uh, well, we yeah, we uh, you do have a not a four on this, so we will continue to work with uh, Congressman on that plan. Does anyone else have other business?
Or do would anyone like to make a motion? I move to adjourn. Second. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Miranda? Mary, Mary Larson. Yes. <laughs> yes. Trustee Taylor. Yes. yes. Trustee Apt. Yes. Trustee Danforth. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Baumhover. Yep. Trustee Corbin. Yeah. Trustee Coombs as mile. Yes, please. Meeting is adjourned at 1044 p.m. Thank you everyone for the discussions tonight and look forward to the